Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting, the first regular meeting of the, of the two we expect to have this month of the Zoning Board of Adjustment for Portsmouth. Uh, we have a standard meeting tonight with one exception. The first order of business is going to be a presentation by uh, former city attorney Robert Sullivan, and he's going to be discussing legislative changes that are enacted through HB House Bill 1661. So, Mr. Solomon, if you care to come up, We're, as many as are going to be here tonight are here. Good evening, everybody. As uh, Chairman's pointed out, former City Attorney Robert Sullivan. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am uh, I'm here tonight uh, to talk about a change in state law, a recent change to state law effective only at the end of August, which uh, which will change the way that every zoning board and every planning board in the state uh, has to conduct its business. Uh, I assumed that with 270-odd uh, town, cities and towns in the state, that means about 540 boards are going to have to be thinking about the very things I'm going to talk with you about tonight. Um, <clears throat> as such, uh, there is no established reaction uh, by the boards and uh, planning boards and zoning boards to this change in state law. So we are all just going to have to figure this out together, uh, everyone in the state. Um, you have the advantage that uh, the town zoning boards don't have, uh, which is a full-time planning staff of professionals who by education and experience uh, can provide you with a great deal of assistance. You also have a full-time <coughs> legal department uh, to serve the same purpose. I would uh, I would introduce at this point uh, the real city attorney now, uh, Susan Morrell, who's in the back of the room. Uh, everybody says she's smarter than me. So, uh, so she deserves more than that. <laughs> she wants a low hurdle. Uh, so I, uh, I'm sure that she will render good service to you as the years go on. Uh, the law that we're here to talk about uh, for a minute, I thought I didn't have my glasses, and I was just going to have to invent this whole presentation. <laughs> the the law that we're here to talk about was adopted um, by the legislature as HB 1661. Um, and the first thing to notice about this law is this was not a statute in which the state legislature uh, carefully considered zoning and planning issues <laughs> and made a, uh, a narrow and refined adjustment in state law. Quite the opposite. This is a state law which was a real catch-all hodgepodge of various different things. Uh, in one session law, in one act of the legislature, consider, for example, there was uh, provisions regarding sending school districts uh, and technical education, uh, making an appropriation for a legislative parking garage in the city of Concord, uh, establishing a special fund for the administration of opioid treatment programs, establishing a pilot program for individuals with developmental disabilities, uh, revises the uh, state's authority to recover unauthorized payments made by the state, uh, establishes investigatory, proce investigatory procedures and licensing criteria for recreational camps, uh, <clears throat> uh, 
creates a separate category of foster care license for kinship care homes. I saw one here that I thought was to be my favorite and I want to talk to you about. Uh, removes the criminal background check requirement for designated caregivers in the therapeutic cannabis program <laughs> and modifies the criminal background check uh, requirement for alternative treatment center agents. Now, I offer all that up to you just so that you'll understand why there might be a little bit of vagueness in the parts of this law which talk about uh, your procedures. Uh, it was, the, uh, as I said, just part of uh, really kind of a hash of different laws all stuck together. Now reaching into the hash and pulling Bob, out. Bob, if I just may interject, I'm the legislative liaison for a state department and this bill um, is called the garage tree bill. Um, usually Christmas tree bills where there's something underneath the Christmas tree for everybody, but the legislators wanted a legislative garage, so a lot of things got pulled out of other bills and put into this bill. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so the parts of this law that we're going to talk about right now change the procedures that you have to follow in making your decisions. Uh, <clears throat> specifically, at RSA 272 colon 73, the administrative enforcement procedures which apply to you and apply to the planning board uh, have been amended uh, in the following way. Uh, language has been added to the state law which says that when you make a decision, quote, the decision shall include specific written findings of fact that support the decision. Uh, failure of the board to make specific written findings of fact supporting a disapproval shall be grounds for automatic reversal of your disapproval and remand by the Superior Court upon appeal of your decision. Um, the, the change that this makes from your prior procedure uh, is this. The board was always required to make findings of fact in support of its decision. However, in prior times, those findings of facts could be located anywhere in the certified record of your proceedings where they could be found. So when there was an appeal filed in court, for example, um, what we would do in the city legal department in defending your position is we would look at the video or more commonly have a transcript, a verbatim transcript of what you had done prepared and we would comb through that film or that document looking for statements that zoning board members might have made in the course of making a decision that we could then cite to the court as being the factual support for what you had done. Uh, this allowed a fair amount of latitude in, uh, in defending your decisions. Um, I think the obvious effect of this new law, this new law is that that latitude is uh, very much diminished now. Uh, you are going to be required to state on the record what findings of fact you make to support your decisions. And if you do not, uh, A, it's automatic reversal of any disapprovals which you've made, and B, if someone appeals an approval that you have made, it will have to somehow be defended in the face of the fact that you're required to make findings of fact, and if you didn't do them, it would seem to put us at a disadvantage in, in court. So, so that is your new challenge. Uh, to, to deal with the challenge, And I think first we should talk about what this finding of fact is, what this thing is that you now have to do very specifically <clears throat> in every letter of decision. Uh, in some ways, it might be easier to begin defining a finding of fact 
by talking about what it is not. Uh, the statement that an applicant has met the required elements for the granting of a variance or a special exception, that statement, standing alone, is not a fact. So making that statement on the record does not satisfy your new statutory obligation. Uh, that statement is a legal conclusion. And uh, when you make your decision at the end of any application, that's when you're making your legal conclusion. Uh, your legal conclusion is not particularly relevant to satisfying this statute. Uh, quite the opposite, you have to make as I said, specific findings of fact. Now I'll give you an example of what a finding of fact is to help you crystallize in your mind what you have to be looking for from here on out. Uh, and that is this. In a neighborhood where there were single family residential lots which were square or rectangular in shape, if there was one particular lot that was triangular in shape, so that you might find uh, normal side yard rules, for example, should not apply and you should grant a variance, the finding that the lot in question is triangular in a neighborhood of otherwise square or rectangular lots, that's a finding of fact. And you need to make those kind of statements, you need to make them on the record. Uh, and you need to make them to support all of your decisions, granting or denying applications. Um, <clears throat> as I said uh, a few minutes ago, you have the advantage of a professional planning department and a professional planning staff. And uh, with those individuals uh, and city attorneys, uh, we have discussed how it is that uh, city staff can help you do your job. Uh, one of the concerns we have is just that the mere act of having to slow down and state specific findings of fact is time consuming and, uh, and your meetings often run very late. Uh, we are worried that they would now run later. Um, in addition to which, uh, there are seven members of the board and uh, all seven are not going to see every application the same way. Uh, each of you will have your own view of what the facts are <clears throat> to support or oppose any particular application. And we wanted to find a way to help you coalesce your thinking so that the decision of the board as a whole can clearly list facts that you all agree upon. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the method that we have decided thus far that would probably be of most assistance to you uh, is to prepare form documents that you can look at and you should have, have them in front of you right now. Um, these form documents will, will describe to you in every particular case what the requirement legal elements are, what you need to be looking for. Uh, variance request requires unnecessary hardship and it'll define the term so that you can be, have that definition in your mind when you look at facts. And that might prompt you to think a triangular lot needs to be treated differently than a rectangular lot when it comes to side yards or rear yards, that kind of thing. Um, the, in the document that you have in front of you, and at least for the time being as we go forward, the planning staff is going to review applications and suggest to you facts that you might find uh, either in favor or opposed to an application. Um, the planning staff, as I said, professionals who by education and experience know how to do this, but the law requires that you, not the staff, make these findings a fact. So um, this form and those suggestions are simply to help you uh, not take your place. Um, the, uh, the way it should work is that it will, as you know, in order to be entitled to, re 
to get a variance, for example, a particular property owner has to satisfy in a positive way all the elements of the variance test. If you make your findings of fact item by item on your way through the test, and when you've completed your form, you look down and you see that there are adequate findings of facts supporting every element, well, that is actually going to suggest what your decision should be. In that case, uh, you would probably determine that the, the variance ought to be granted, for example. Conversely, if you do not find supporting facts on some particular required element, well, that will suggest to you uh, that the application should be denied. This is how we think it will work. And we think that by your reviewing and either adopting, modifying, or rejecting the suggested facts that you will get from the planning staff, your work will be made easier. Uh, the evenings can go more quickly than otherwise. And in fact, your decision should be more sound and definitely more defensible in the end. So that's, uh, that's the plan. It's how we see the plan to proceed starting right now. Uh, as I said, all over New Hampshire, zoning boards are struggling with this same issue tonight. Uh, and, uh, and we will, in planning and legal departments, we will keep our eye on what's going on around. We'll read cases from other zoning boards in other places. And if it turns out that there's some good idea that comes up, uh, we will bring it to you so can, you can incorporate it into your procedures. If it turns out that some of our ideas, as I have expressed to you tonight, are not good ideas, in fact are bad ideas, then we will bring that to you too as well and ask you to uh, reject or not to consider our prior advice. So we'll be looking every day to try to find further things that can help you as you go forward with this. But I've now described the new law, I've described what our process is to try to deal with it, and where we plan to go from here as, as the law evolves. Um, so with all that in mind, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to do the best I could with them. Any, anybody who's first? Must be something. <laughs> Mr. Mantle? No? Okay. Anybody? I thank you. I, thank you. Let me just bring up one thing. When I first heard about this, and I said, "Yeah, that all sounds fine." And we, and we, I'd like to think we state facts. And as you say, though they may, they're buried in the uh, in the text. But the one with respect to the value of property, I'm thinking that that isn't so clear. That's that's unlike you know something is or are not likely to diminish property that's that's not something you can get out there with a ruler and and address is there any particular it, it, guidance with respect to that that that's to me is not a crystal clear simple you're correct we deal with property valuations in city hall every single day they're starting really with tax bills that go out all of which have to be based <laughs> upon uh, property valuations uh, you are correct there's no yardstick that you can really apply but nonetheless whether a particular act might increase or decrease um, the values of uh, neighboring properties, uh, that is a factual decision that you have to make. Uh, and uh, you need to make it based upon whatever evidence is presented to you by either the applicant or those in opposition to an application. And uh, you, you just have to make the decision. And, and obviously, as in everything, to the extent that you can support uh, that decision with some further finding of fact um, based upon uh, what you as, as you know, thinking human beings decide about looking at a situation, you should do that and put it in as well and the staff will be available to help you word your findings of fact. Okay, Any, anybody else? No? Everybody's good? Or Peter, public, anything? No? You all set? Mr. Are, are, Mr. Morassi? Are the submission of public comments, are those facts or simply, I mean, what are they if we get public comments? Uh, it depends upon the particular comment. Uh, remember, facts, for our purpose, have to be relevant to the elements yeah. of, uh, that you have to look at. So if one neighbor says, well, my neighbor is a bad person, don't give them any relief. Uh, 
that's not a fact because it's not relevant to any issue that is in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if they said the use that my neighbor wants to put of his or her house will diminish the value of my house because nobody would want to buy my house with that use of property next to it, that is a fact. Mm -hmm. So you have to decide these things on a case-by-case -case basis as each thing is said to you uh, by the speakers or presented to you in the so we look at the elements of what's in the public comments. That can be a fact, not just the mere fact that we receive the public comment. I think that's correct. That is absolutely correct. And, and the, the planning staff is going to try to help separate the wheat from the chaff on these things by focusing you, and the chairman will certainly do this too, by focusing on the necessary elements upon which you need to find a fact. Do you find this would increase... Um, the value of a property or diminished value of a property. Thank you. Anybody, anybody else? No. Thank, thank you very much, Bob. Appreciate My it. My pleasure. This thank is, you. That's going to be a help. All righty. Okay. Before we uh, go on to the uh, new business, I should state the ground rules that we uh, operate under. And that is that the presenter of the application has 15 minutes to, to make the presentation. Uh, if that is a, is that appears to be insufficient, before the presentation starts, we ask that the presenter or the team uh, ask for a request for an additional five minutes, and the board votes that up or up or down. At the end of that presentation. We ask for those in the audience or via Zoom who would like to speak in favor to please come forward and do so. And we then limiting it to five minutes. And then we do the same thing for those who are in opposition, limiting it to five minutes. And then the last call is two for or against. There's no time limit on those comments. And if you spoke previously, you may speak again. But we ask that people be very uh, succinct in their comments and just address the, uh, the main points that are at issue rather than just carry on and repeat and repeat and repeat. So usually people are pretty good about following those rules. So that's having said all that, that's where we are. Uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the next item of business on the uh, agenda this evening is the approval of the minutes which we all have received for the meetings of, for the meeting of August 16, our last meeting. Does everyone have a comment or a correction or an addition or anything with respect to those minutes? I thought they were very well done. Uh, does someone have a motion? M Ms. Margeson? I move to approve the minutes. Thank you. And the second, does someone have a second? Mr. Mantle, thank you. Your, your motion, please. Uh, just to, uh, there are no corrections to the mini minutes. They were captured correctly and they seem complete. Thank you. Mr. Mantle, agree? What she said, I'm Th good. Thank you. Those in favor, we'll, a voice for will do on this. Those in favor of the minutes as they're presented to us uh, be to be approved, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, thank you. Okay, minutes are approved as prepared. Okay, let's move right on to old business. Number one is 266 State Street, and the request is for a one-year extension. And uh, does someone have a motion with respect to that request? Mr. Mantle? Make a motion to approve the one-time, one-year exception. Thank you, second to that motion. Ms. Ms. Eldridge, thank you. Uh, your comments, please. Um, we grant um, one-year delays all the time. Uh, obviously, they have a good reason because the building permit has not been issued yet. So I'm all in favor of granting them a one-time, one-year extension as requested. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Elders? Ms. Elders? You're I'm second? Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> uh, I have nothing to add. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. A voice vote. Those in favor of the motion to approve, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? None? Okay. Good. One year. The uh, request is approved for a one year extension. Okay. Uh, under old business, item B reads as follows The request of Joel St. Jean and Marielle Chambers, owner. 
for property located at 108 Burkett Street, whereas relief is re needed to demolish an existing garage and construct a new 13 foot by 30 foot garage, which requires the following. One, a variance from section 10.573.20 to allow a one foot left side yard where 10 feet is required. Two, a variance from section 10.321 to allow a non-conforming structure or building to be extended, reconstructed, or enlarged without conforming to the requirements of the ordinance. Said property is located on assessor map 159 as lot 30 and lies within the general residence A GRA district. Who, present, who presents this uh, project, please? Good evening, Chairman Parrott. Uh, good evening, Vice Chair Lee and distinguished board members. My name is Joel St. Jean. I'm here this evening with my fiance, Mariel Chambers, to present this project. Excuse um, me, could you could you move that? Yes, sir. A lot, the, these things are a little tricky. You have to kind of speak to the, in the use, end of it if you can. Can I use this? It's a little. You can, if yes, you want to hold yeah. that one, you can. Yeah. Or just. This might be. Yep. You were tall. The That's made for short people, that, that one. <laughs> <laughs> is this better? Much better. Okay. Th thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Joel St. Jean. Uh, thank you for your consideration in hearing our project this evening. Uh, for 108 Burkett Street. Um, Peter, if we could please start at the survey with the red lines, please. Um, with regards to our variance, I'll kind of go through the uh, Section 10 articles first um, to, to lead the way here. Um, so the variance will not be contrary to the public interest because given the age materials used, and the size of the garage, rebuilding under the new plan will improve the function, use, and safety while assisting in the overall neighborhood function and appeal. Building to modern day standards will provide the ability to house modern day cars, transportation, and provide uh, better usability. Uh, the spirit of the ordinance will be observed because it does not threaten the health, safety, nor welfare of the general public or neighbors. In fact, abating uh, the asbestos siding, removing rot, mold, mildew covered structure will rid the public and owners of these hazards. Uh, substantial justice will be done because it does not threaten the health, safety, nor welfare of the general public, nor the current or future owners and neighbors. The building of this new garage will benefit the image, appeal, and state of Burkett Street neighborhood, as well as create a structure that is more functional to today's standards of home care. Um, the values of surrounding properties will not de be diminished. In fact, the updating to use of modern day building techniques and materials should only help make the area, area safer and more appealing. Uh, literal enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship. As it currently stands, water, water gathers around the foundation due to poor drainage. It is also causing rot on the garage door, wooden structure, and outer siding. By removing the current garage and placing the new one, foundation will be fixed to modern day standards to allow the water to go and seep into the ground appropriately. Um, water will not be stagnant. Um, in addition, the use of this garage would significantly improve the quality of life for its current owners given my height. It's fairly short inside of the garage and I hit my head all the time. Um, in addition, uh, my fiance and I plan on having children in the coming years, so the additional space for childhood related items would be extremely beneficial. Um, as you can see here, we were given the opportunity uh, to get an updated survey on August 10th of this year. And again, thank you for postpone, accepting our postponing <coughs> to this date uh, so that we could provide you with these updated plans. Oops, let's see here. Does this work? So if you can see here, we've got our original garage with the black flanges. That current garage is measuring at 18.5 feet long by 12.1 feet wide, uh, given 216 square feet. In the center, it's about 11 feet tall, and on the edges, it's seven feet two inches from the ground. Um, what we're proposing is this red line to be added, and it would follow the current lineage of the old structure. So we would be at essentially tearing this structure on and adding this red part in addition to this already 
black area here. Um, our proposed dimensions are 30 feet long by 13.75 feet wide, uh, with the height being 14 feet at the center and 10 feet at the edge. Um, we would like to put a series of doors in the front, or so a garage door in the front so that vehicles can easily move into the garage and a set of doors in the back so that, you know, lawn care equipment and things can be brought into the backyard to maintain it properly. Um, one thing I would like to point out is with our variants, we were able to get proper um, lot lines with all the butters on both sides in the back and um, I would open the floor for any questions at the moment. Thank you for for listening. Any any questions for the presenter at this point? Anybody at all? No. Uh, yeah, I do have Mr. One. Rossi. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, can you restate what is the height of the existing garage on the sidewall versus the proposed uh, garage? Yes, sir, Mr. Rossi. Uh, so the height in the middle is currently 11 feet tall, and both are. I guess the tallest edge is seven feet from the ground, and that's in the back. It's a little bit shorter in the front. That's the current? Yes, that is current. And the proposed? Is 10 feet. 10 feet high in the center or on the? 10 side? feet high on the edge and 14 feet in the center. So it'd be increasing by three feet all around. I see, okay, thank you. Anybody else? Anything at all? No, apparently not. Thank you very much. Other, is there anyone present or on Zoom who would like to uh, speak in support of this proposal? Anybody wishing to speak in support? Anybody at all? Last call? Okay. Any, Mr. Stith, anybody? No. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone present or via Zoom wishing to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anybody? Anybody, last call? Uh, okay. We have um, oh, Richard, Richard Brady. Let oh. me. Okay. What's, what's the name? Uh, Richard Brady, if you, if you could just Brady. unmute yourself. Hello? Yes. Yeah, go right ahead, please. Thank you very much. I wanted to be there tonight. I apologize. My wife and I are here. We're direct the butters to Joel and, and Marielle, but I have COVID, so. Um, we just wanted to state that we're not in opposition to the new garage that Joel and Marielle would like, simply where they would like to place it. The, the, the placement right on the border, Joel had mentioned that he's already got drainage issues, as do we. And while there's no stopping water from running downhill, adding a 30 foot roof line right on the property line and removing the existing natural buffer is just gonna increase the issues that we already have. The second point that we have is creating a, a solid wall is going to change the structure of our backyard. It, it, basically, it's, a, it's an unnatural wall. We're, we're excited that they want to build a new garage, and, and, and we again, we support their garage, but it's going to be right along our yard, and it's going to, it'll block the sunlight coming into the side yard. And, and so all we're really asking is that, you know, we at least discuss it and uphold the existing 10-foot ordinance or something closer to it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any, anybody else? Um, no. No? Okay. All right. Last call for speakers. Two, four, or against. Last call. Last call. Anybody? Electronically or in prison? By present, no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, the public the public hearing is cl closed. Uh, board, what's your uh, what's your pleasure on this one? Someone? Anyone have a have a d point of discussion or perhaps a motion, <laughs> Ms. <coughs> Ms. Margerson? I will move to approve the variance as presented and advertised. Uh, thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Thank you, Mr. Mantle. Ms. Margerson, you're 
your uh, motion, if you would, please. Okay, using our new handy dandy checklist. Um, <laughs> the criteria is as follows uh, 10.233.21, granting the variance would not be contrary to the public interest. And I will say yes to that. And 10.233.22. Granting the variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance, and I will say yes to that. The relevant facts I'm going to put together because the spirit and intent uh, are and uh, are often stated together. Um, in dealing with whether or not the spirit and intent of the ordinance is observed, um, we have to look at three factors: whether or not it will alter the essential character of the neighborhood, um, whether health, safety is or welfare is threatened, and whether or not there is mere conflict or unduly marked uh, or a serious conflict with the zoning ordinance. And with those um, criteria in mind, I will say that um, altering the essential character of the neighborhood, this is a replacement of a garage and a residential area. Uh, I do not see that there's any uh, threatened health, safety, or welfare by the replacement of the <clears throat> garage to the, to the area. And um, I find that there is just a mere conflict with the spirit and intent of the zoning ordinance in that um, the setbacks are meant to improve light, air, and circulation. This application actually improves the setbacks from zero to two, according to the latest uh, survey. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Peter? So we need to put the stipulation on at the end that it's actually for two, as you suggested. Um, the I would find that according to 10.233.23, granting the variance would do substantial justice. And here the criteria is that there must be a benefit to the public, which is outlaid by the loss to the applicant. I do not find that this, um, this application results in any um, uh, benefit to the public as it is just a garage. Um, granting the variance would not diminish the values of the surrounding properties. We did not receive any kind of evidence on that, however, the replacement of a old dilapidated garage that creates stormwater problems with a new functional garage, which better serves the house, um, definitely would be a, um, would enhance the values of the surrounding properties. And then of course the hard one, 10.233.25, little enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance will result in unnecessary hardship. And here we have to say that the property has special conditions that distinguish it from other properties in the area. And owing to these special conditions, a fair and substantial relationship does not exist between the general public purposes of the ordinance provision and the specific application of that provision to the property. And the proposed use is a reasonable one. And taking that from the top, um, the reality is, is that this property does not have special conditions <clears throat> in and of itself because a lot of the properties in the surrounding area are also 50 feet wide. However, I will note that every single house, almost every single house, every single house surrounding this property has uh, structures that are within the uh, setbacks. Um, and so therefore there is an existing nonconformity in the neighborhood. Um, and therefore the, um, I do not find that the um, application of this particular provision, which is the side yard setback, um, is, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, is, is reasonable with respect to the application to this property. Um, the proposed use is a reasonable one. This is a garage for a house in a residential area. And I will note that, you know, according to the survey that the applicant provided to us, um, moving this house would probably, moving this garage would encroach on some part of the setback. There's a very large 20 yard setback in the back of the, the property. Um, so I find no other place for this garage to go. Is that, is that enough here or is that too much? Or? <laughs> and did you want to add? Oh, and the stipulation. stipulation. Um, the stipulation that Peter asked for us to add was the, I got to go back two to foot, it. Two foot side yard. The two foot, yes. It, the, uh, it's a two foot side yard. <clears throat> and that was due to the updated survey. Yeah, the left side door to be two feet. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Took a lot of scroll. <laughs> it's all set. Long, <laughs> Thank you. Your, your second. I agree verbatim. Okay. I cannot. No, I cannot nothing to add. Make okay. that any better. Okay. <laughs> 
Thank you. All right. Any any further discussion on the board before we take a vote on this motion, which to uh, to approve with one stipulation regarding two feet? Okay. Anybody? No. Okay. Uh, we'll start down with Mr. Mantle. Yes. And Mr. Lee. Yes. Ms. Margerson. Yes. Ms. Eldridge. Mr. Rossi. Yes. yes. I'm, I'm yes. too fast. <laughs> Thank you both. And uh, I, vo I vote yes as well. The motion is approved. And the project is approved. Thank you, everybody. You're welcome. You are a test case. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving along swiftly. <clears throat> get my back to my agenda uh, item C under old business is as follows the request of Jeffrey C Christensen attorney for the applicants for property located at 225 Banfield Road for a rehearing of the May 24 2022 decision of the Zoning Board of Adjustments granting of a request for variances to demolish the existing building and constructing a new five unit commercial building and 60 unit residential building with underground parking which requires the following. One, a variance from section 10.440 to allow a 60 unit residential building where residential uses are not permitted in the industrial district. Said property is located on Assessor Map 254 as Lot 1 and Map 266 as Lot 2 and lies within the Industrial District. Who speaks, who presents this project, please, this request? Good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. My name is John Cronin, an attorney from Manchester with the firm of Cronin, Bisson, and Zielinski. I'm here to represent the applicant this evening. I know this is a matter on rehearing. I had an opportunity to speak to uh, Mr. Stith beforehand, and he thought it was best that we proceed initially where this is a rehearing matter. Uh, as an issue of procedure, I've been doing this for approximately uh, as long as the city attorney, and I was pleased to hear his uh, excellent summary on the new House bill and the required findings, and it begged the question if, uh, whether or not there's a staff recommendation in this case and whether you have been presented with, uh, with initial consideration for findings, because that would be probably important for me to look at and understand as I'm presenting the case. So I don't know if procedurally if that's something uh, that's... That's not, not the case. Staff typically does not give recommendations to this board. This, yes, and I will add that this board specifically has voted on that issue and has said to the staff, that's our job and we don't want recommendations. Just for your background information. Yeah, I heard it and was very interested. I thought it was a very thorough presentation and very uh, helpful to me, but it just uh, raised the question in my mind of whether or not there was uh, issues that I should be looking mm -hmm. at as I made my presentation to highlight on those facts that may be uh, important to you. There's another procedural matter. I know in your initial introduction you uh, uh, gave the 15-minute time allotment and said if you think you might go over, you should request at the beginning for an additional five minutes. I'd like to do that if possible. All right. Well, is there a – the request is for an additional five minutes for the presentation and – we normally will take a vote on this. Is Does someone wish to make a motion with respect to that request? Anybody? No? Anybody? I'd, Mr. I'd Mr. Lee? I'd move to grant the uh, five, extra five minutes. Thank you. Is there a second to the motion to grant the five minutes? I'll second. Ms. Eldridge, thank you. Sure. Uh, the, a voice vote will do on this. Uh, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Okay. Yeah. Yes, you have, your, you have 20 minutes total. Uh, thank you. If I could ask that the uh, plan that's been submitted that shows uh, the relative site and its uh, proximity to the Pike property and the uh, charted distances, I think that will be important as we go through the presentation. I think that can... Uh, give you a layout. I presume some or all of you may have been to the site and certainly are very well familiar with it based on its proximity. Excuse yes. me. Um, do you represent Mr. Ritchie? Yes, the, the applicant this evening. Okay. But this is a rehearing at the request of the appellant. That's correct. 
Okay, so, we're, so we're doing a new hearing, and the applicant is presenting their case again, mm -hmm. and then the okay. appellant okay. will have a chance to get up. Okay. Right. I wasn't sure how that procedure worked, but we had a chance to okay. discuss mm -hmm. it, and it's, I was asked to, to, to proceed forward. Yeah, it's a, yeah. just start starting over, yeah, essentially. Okay. Just to, to give you a, a proximity of the site, it's currently two tax maps right now, uh, 254 lot one and 266 lot one. It's approved with a building that's uh, been around there for some time. It's the uh, home of the Ritchie Construction Building. You will see it. It was built in a, a later time. We're not sure if the 50s or the 30s, but it's been there for many years, probably before the recent enactment of the current uh, zoning ordinance. That particular building sits about 34 <clears throat> and three-quarter feet from the, the front of the road, uh, the setback. Uh, there's a much uh, greater setback, 70 feet required now under the existing ordinance. And one of the issues for relief we are looking for is the setback with respect to the new commercial industrial building that's proposed to be built on that site. Uh, what we will be doing on that particular site is pushing the building back from its existing location. And at the end of the day, you'd have a 45-foot setback uh, as opposed to the current 34.7. Uh, we believe that that uh, is improving uh, what is currently a non-conforming use. It did not seem to be in the prior hearings that, that was too much of an issue, uh, but I did not want to uh, uh, pass it over and not address it. Uh, we'll give some more space. It will push the building back uh, and make for more visibility. With respect to uh, the actual layout of, of the place in the building, this is a, an unusual lot. Uh, you can see that its shape in the middle of it sits a residential building or a residential home that's been there for some time, and there's kind of a box around it. So if you look at the Ritchie building as it sits, it has some frontage up in the back near the community fields. There's a large section, and that tail comes on the other side of the residential housing in terms of proximity. Uh, when you look at the particular neighborhood and you make a drive down there, uh, you will see some commercial uses as you head down towards Ritchie, then Ritchie, the residential home. You have the, the school down in that area and directly across the street, uh, which is really visible from uh, the Ritchie site, is the new Green and Company subdivision with uh, the beautiful homes that I understand were well received by the market. Uh, the Pike facility, no doubt, is right next door. It abuts it uh, up on the, the back side there. The entrance to the Pike site is quite a distance away. I had the pleasure of walking the site, uh, walking some neighboring sites, walking the community fields, and actually going into Pike to take a look at some of those uh, measurements. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the actual scope of it, the distance from the proposed closest corner of the apartment facility, uh, which is uh, proposed to be 60 units, we recognize that the planning board, if it gets there, would have some discretion to talk about units, composition, and unit mix, and that's something that they always take up. That's about 400 feet. There's 1,500 feet in distance from that corner to uh, what you call the asphalt or concrete plant. It's very impressed with the Pike site, uh, very clean, very systematic. Uh, from the community fields, you could park your vehicle and get a very direct view of the operations were there. The time I viewed it, it was, uh, you know, one piece of equipment seemed to be loading some things from the bituminous pile onto a, a, a dump truck, which you did hear some intermittent backup whistles. But other than that, it was uh, rather uneventful. Uh, I was surprised how close it was to the community fields and that there was absolutely no buffer. When I was uh, pacing through the, the, the Ritchie field and looking out back, I did note that there was not only a, an ample existing buffer, and unless it was pointed out to you, and to what it was from their site, you really couldn't get a, a scope or sense of what was there. Certainly once it was and you could peek through the trees, you could see it. I'm sure in winter months that may change and may be more visible. Uh, you could see directly to some of the back of the, the new homes as well, and they would have direct sight lines. Uh, but what I did notice, uh, between the proposed site and the existing tree line, uh, there's ample area outside the proposed development that would allow for much more additional buffer and evergreen and non-deciduous trees that would provide uh, a more ample screen for that particular site. Uh, when you look at the, the way that it's laid out in the proposal uh, for the building, it sets down in the back. There's a proposal to include uh, access uh, through trail and bike to the community fields. 
uh, which would be beneficial, we believe, to people that live there. And I think it's no secret uh, when looking at your community, particularly, which uh, you know you must get the gold star and blue ribbon for uh, the improvements that this community has made over the last several decades. It's popular, it's in demand, and like many places in New Hampshire, uh, there's not enough housing of every type and kind. And we see that in some of the materials that we submitted that uh, not only is it not good for uh, the workers, it's not good for employers. Uh, people, I'm sure you've all been to the coffee shops with signs saying closed at noon because we don't have help, uh, closed on different days because we don't have help. And not only at uh, coffee shops, but in professional, it's hard to get uh, people to, uh, to find adequate housing. This particular uh, proposal, it's not proposed as an affordable or a workforce type proposal. Uh, we recognize that's always something that can be discussed uh, with the planning board when you get there, but it does have a dramatic impact on numbers. If you look at some of the workforce and subsidies, it changes the densities and the deltas, but it's not something that's uh, not beyond consideration. When you look at this site being outside the inner city where uh, rents I know are at their peak, that will provide some natural relief from that, and it's expected that these units, which are currently proposed, again, subject to planning board discretion as studios and one bedrooms, will be attractive for the singles and young professionals and couples and it's really not a, a children generator. We asked Mark Fugier, Fugier, who's a recognized expert, a planning consultant. Uh, he's done it for us in many other communities to take a look at Portsmouth, look at this particular proposal and the children generation, and also uh, take a look at uh, what the current school enrollment is to see if there's an impact. Uh, he's put a letter in the file that's uh, before you and was submitted. Uh, his indication is approximately three school-age children uh, would be resident in this particular facility, and that's based on established statistics. He also took a look at uh, the current enrollments, and like most communities uh, throughout New Hampshire, have a general state of elementary enrollment decline and more than sufficient capacity to uh, handle children. And I think the children emphasis is important when we get to the five criteria, and I address the uh, spirit and intent of the ordinance and the public interest because I know health, safety, and welfare is something that we need to discuss. And some of the concerns not only raised by Pike, uh, but just moments before coming here today, I uh, got an email with a, a letter, I believe, uh, from a health official that was uh, submitted or is going to be submitted into the, the record this evening. And I think the concern there was for school-age children. Uh, my posit on that is if uh, school-age children were a concern relative to Pike, whether it be for asthma, noise, or whatever, I suspect uh, the folks and the fathers of the town would not situate the community fields so close to that facility where there is no protection, no one inside, not living in air-conditioned space, not living in protected space, uh, but out in the open uh, next to those. So <clears throat> as far as uh, looking at health, safety, and welfare, I'll address that uh, momentarily. Uh, as far as uh, rehearing, <clears throat> I recognize that uh, you know that's your prerogative to do in a public meeting versus a public hearing, and applicants and abutters don't generally have an opportunity to comment. But I recognize it's pretty well settled in New Hampshire that the rehearing process is not an opportunity for a second bite at the apple. Uh, it's essentially a process to identify for board members what you did illegally or what you did unreasonably. And clearly in your initial decision, I could find nothing in the papers that were submitted that alleged that you did anything illegally. There is some argument there that you may have done something uh, that people may not have liked, that may have been a concern, uh, but as the Supreme Court said, the guardrails of reasonableness are very broad. And although people may not agree with your decision, it doesn't per se make it unreasonable. So I would conclude in looking at it and looking at the record in its entirety that you got it right the first time, but I respect your decision and your sole decision without public input to make a, uh, a decision on rehearing. So I just make that argument for the record as a matter of preservation. Uh, when I look <coughs> at this uh, particular standard and look at the criteria that we have, and you look at the building elevations, I know those are conceptual and it's in an early stage. A building of this nature can be well designed 
uh, to give it an industrial and a commercial feel. Uh, so from the exterior, it uh, doesn't look distinguishing at all from other uses that might go there. For instance, you could look at a bluebird storage or some type of high bay warehouse, and uh, although they may be more windows and a little bit of different facade, uh, it can be generally designed in such a way that it looks very similar. Uh, this proposal also has the additional benefit of underground podium style parking, so the parking would be in part underneath the building, uh, which is also an advantage where people wouldn't be outside. Uh, we don't believe that this particular use will uh, <coughs> end type of proposal with the mix of units will be one where you see a lot of people playing outside. Uh, it's just not a, a kid-centric type of use. Uh, people will be going and coming from work, whether uh, by car or by scooter, and uh, doing their recreating in the beautiful downtown that you have. Uh, when you look at the five criteria, and uh, based on Farrar versus Keene, the public interest and the spirit of the ordinance can be considered together because the standard is essentially the same. And when you look at it, there's two ways for an applicant to demonstrate that to meet, to meet your test. One is to show there'll be no negative impact to health, safety, and welfare from the proposed use. And the other one is to show that if the variance is approved, it will not in a marked or a substantial way alter the essential character of the neighborhood. The neighborhood does not include just one building beside it, but it includes the entire area, regardless of how it's zoned. And I think it's uh, well settled that that area is a mixed use area. If you drive down Banfield, you'll see a lot of different uses and a lot of different places, and they coexist very well together. I will note in Pike's papers, uh, they made citation frequently to Euclid versus Ambler. And uh, that case, you, you may all well know it or have heard of it before, uh, but that's a landmark case from the U.S. Supreme Court that basically said communities under their police power have the right to zone. That was a 1926 case back in the, the early days of the Industrial Revolution. We didn't have mixed use. We didn't have the housing crisis that we had today. And we don't have apartments in the shape and configuration as how they're built today. And I would say that's as far from relevant to the matter before you as any other case might be. I would also make particular note in the papers, which I'm sure in some respects have sparked your decision to have this rehearing, uh, there's a distinction made between a use variance and an area variance. That was the old law. That was pre-Gray Rocks and Simplex. Uh, where you had two different standards for do, two different types of variances. That's no longer the case. Uh, based on the trilogy of cases that came out of uh, the Supreme Court, starting with Gray Rocks, uh, that was a case in which uh, rare for land use lawyers to cite to dissenting opinions. But Justice Sherman Horton, who was on the Supreme Court, he was a, a well-regarded land use lawyer from Nashua, and he went directly from practice at the end of his career to uh, the Supreme Court, and he was well regarded in real estate and land use cases. He wrote a dissent saying that the hardship test at that particular time, uh, it was unconstitutional. And he thought New Hampshire had to look around to other states and other methods and adopt a more reasonable standard. It was focused on reasonableness, not on what the alternative uses for the land might be. I remember in my first case in the mid-80s, I think it was in Rye, uh, the, the boss gave me the file and said, do a variance tonight. It was uh, someone with an undersized lot that wanted to get a variance to build on it. And the boss said, don't worry about it. You're not going to win because if you can graze a cow on that land, you have an alternative use for it. Thankfully, uh, that ship has come and gone. And the, the standard today is, uh, is quite different. After Bochia, uh, after Gray Rocks, uh, we had the Bochia case, which kind of deflected it a little bit, and then it got to Simplex. And the Simplex standard is a much more relaxed standard that uh, functions basically on reasonableness. Uh, you do have to show a fair and substantial, no fair and substantial relationship to the property from the ordinance in its various application. And I read with interest in your zoning the definition of industrial. It says, this zone, the industrial zone, is to accommodate the industrial, wholesale, and storage areas 
whose operational and physical characteristics do not have detrimental impacts on surrounding areas. Based on the letter from the health officer and based on the comments from Pike, I don't see what possibly you could do on that particular site without raising concerns of asthma, impacts to the community fields, and for all of the other concerns that Pike is raising. And I get it. Uh, I believe someone on high from another state that runs that company has probably got some scars from other developments where uh, the apartments came to the industrial use and they raised complaints and it limited their operations or fatigued them in some ways, and I certainly respect that. But under this standard, if we're looking at it, and based on their own papers of what they're telling us what they're doing, and your own health officer, that would be a non-conforming use, which couldn't grow. And you look at it, the actual operation is quite distant. The trucks going in and out are very, very remote, remote from this site. I sat out at the front and watched where the trucks go. Some go Banfield, but most of them go in other directions, out to the highway. So when you look at that industrial standard in the application, I think we meet it. And in this day and age where uh, we have articles, we have newspaper reports daily, we have the governor talking about an imminent need for housing of all types and kinds. And I've been to different boards and say, look, if this was a workforce or an affordable, we might approve it, but it's market rate. And I have a discussion about supply and demand. I'm saying when right now rents are high because there's limited supply. When you bring more supply in, whether it's affordable or not, it puts the pressure of rents down. So that lowest, oldest on the totem pole, they're probably going to have to reduce their rents to compete. Maybe not immediately, but over time. And we think this use <laughs> in proximity with the layout of the land, its configuration with a residential site in the middle of it, and beautiful homes across the street, and the community fields, we certainly believe that it has some special characteristics. It's not the current state of the law that it has to be unique. It just has to have special characteristics, and we have those. In terms of health, safety, and welfare, and essential character, if these buildings got built there and you drove down Banfield, you wouldn't know the difference. If you went over by Pike and through the back way through that industrial park, and I said, look, I want to put some residential apartments uh, between two of these industrial buildings, I think that's a pretty different case. I might tell the applicant that's probably not a good idea because you're stuck right in the middle of it. You're not in a mixed-use type of zone. I know I have limited time, but I want to address a couple of the other criteria. One is the impact on value. Uh, we've asked Chris Norwood, who's, a, a, I think, a, an officer in Sidebor, a commercial industrial board of realtors, and uh, has been a leading commercial realtor throughout the state who happens to live in Portsmouth, uh, to take a look at the plans go out to the site and take a look at it. And as he states in his opinion paper, his children are at the community fields regularly. And he concludes that if the variances are granted in this particular case, it will not diminish the value of surrounding property values. I think that's a, an element uh, you know, that's to your discretion, but certainly uh, it's someone from a trained professional that uh, has knowledge not <coughs> only about what's being proposed, uh, but the community at large. In terms of the balancing test, uh, substantial justice, uh, that's never been really well defined, and I think the, the court hasn't taken any opportunity to give us clear direction other than say what's the harm to the public if the variance is granted versus to the loss to the applicant if it's denied. In this particular case, uh, the applicant has two independent lots, both pretty small for industrial, if you put industrial on there, you know uh, someone in the residence in the middle of it's probably not going to be too happy. It's not going to have a great impact on the community fields because it would be necessary to clear out a lot, a lot of that uh, existing uh, tree buffer. Uh, probably not something that, that they would want. Uh, I did some analysis of the taxes based on your mill rate and your EQ. I've put that in the papers. Uh, you look at this particular site. I didn't include land because it's already being taxed or the other building, but if you just took the apartment alone, cost of vertical construction being estimated, you're looking at an ad valorem uh, impact of about 200000 per year 
uh, not including what your impact fees would be, and I don't want to suggest that you have them because I'm not familiar with your ordinance, but I assume you do have some impact fee uh, allocations for apartments. Uh, that uh, addresses uh, the criteria. I know at the prior hearing there were a number of folks uh, that came in and uh, either voiced their support for this, and there was others that sent letters. I'd like to incorporate by reference. I think you probably do it anyway as a matter of procedure, but in case you don't, I'd like to incorporate by reference all of the submittals that were made in the initial hearing uh, and to this record so that we have them both combined and we can re review them in their totality. Just That's 20 minutes, so you know, just a little over, actually. But. Well, thank you for your time, and I appreciate uh, the extra five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any anybody have any comments at this point or questions? Or? I have a question for uh, clarification. Uh, excuse me. Can you help me understand how to square your uh, assertion that uh, building additional 60 units of housing will lower rents ultimately in the area, and yet have no impact on the value of surrounding or nearby uh, residential properties? Yeah, I think uh, they're two distinct. Uh, this particular building would be new, right? And it's providing a type of housing, whether it's studio or single bedrooms that are in short supply. So uh, if in Manchester, like me, you owned uh, some apartment buildings that were built in 1988, 1888, excuse me, the old Amiskel mill housing, there's only so much you can do with those to get them up to current nature, current standards. Uh, but they're in demand. Every time a new apartment building comes up in Manchester, which there are many, my rents have to go down to keep my place full because a lot of my tenants would rather be in a 2022 building uh, with fancy appliances and granite countertops than being in a drafty 1888 apartment. So at some point in time, there's equilibrium between supply and demand. So I'm not saying that in this particular area, values are going to go down, but uh, there's a, I think an older building on State Street that was recently sold. I believe it was subsidized housing at one point. I don't know if it's market rate now, and I don't know what type of improvements there. But if they're competing with one bedrooms with newer product, generally the price of the older product will go down in the stable market. I did have one other question. Uh, what was the rationale behind uh, offering the uh, Abutter Pike Industries uh, indemnification against claims for harm and uh, other claims? Isn't that a tacit acknowledgement that harm uh, is a possibility for the people who will ultimately reside there? Uh, I don't think it's any acknowledgement at all. I think anything in the world is possible. And reading their concerns in their papers uh, it said to me that hey, look, these folks are worried that they can't grow and worried about the house coming to the pig farm, so to speak. We've been here for a long time doing a good job what we do, supplying industrial product to the community. Uh, we don't want some newbie coming here saying my trucks are too loud and my piles are too high. So I don't believe that will have any impact based on the buffering and the mixed-use nature of the community. But just to be safe and to give this board some assurance and to give Pike some insurance, I made a recommendation to the applicant. I said, why don't you stand up here and take that risk away? There's a couple of ways that you can do it, right? One is to put provisions in your lease. I did that recently with the former mill, the China Mill in Allenstown, built directly next to the sewer plant. The sewer department was not happy about that building being converted into apartments. They were worried about the very same thing the Pike was worried about that we made a commitment as a condition of approval that we, we would put language in the lease and we're happy to work with the city attorney or the planning board or whoever that clearly states that a resident in this particular property uh, acknowledges the fact that they are next to Pike's facility. We would identify what they do, that there may be loud noises, uh, there may be some odor, uh, there may be some trucks passing across the street and based on that, and based on our landlord-tenant agreement, you have no legal basis to, claim, to make any claim. The second part of that is to say, if they do, right, because in this world, anyone can make a claim about anything. Um, they can ignore the terms of the lease. 
the applicants step up and indemnify Pike for any damage, any cost, any legal fees, or any, any negative issue that may result from that. And that's a pretty, I won't say common condition, but we like to resolve things with the butters when we can. We would love to have their support when we come to these meetings and uh, make an effort to try and have a conversation with them, which I did in this case, to say, is there anything that we can do uh, to try and pacify your concerns? It's our goal to be a good neighbor. What about this? And, you know, uh, Pike is represented by an excellent firm, excellent lawyer, uh, really good people, understood the concern. We had a dialogue, but I think uh, someone on high and maybe from past history and other locations, didn't think that was sufficient to give them the coverage that they needed. So it's meant to address financial liabilities, not address any potential underlying health uh, liabilities for the tenants. I, I missed the, oh. Well, the, 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 the tenants would already have their claim. You can't have a tenant disclaim any health concerns through a lease contract. Uh, RSA 540 and 540A, which is the protective legislation for the tenants. I could have them sign anything, but it's not legally binding or enforceable. Uh, a landlord or any property owner has a duty, an absolute duty under the law, to make their place of residence safe. And if they don't, they're responsible to fix it or relocate the tenant. So. Uh, the reason why tenants aren't addressed in there, one, it's not necessary. They already have that right under existing law. Thank you. Okay, any, anybody else? Any questions? Ms. Madison. It's still, you know, you're not asserting that there won't be any health safety problems to tenants. You're not addressing, I mean, our criteria is that it will not threaten health, safety, and welfare. It's not that we find that you were able to indemnify or whatever your way out of that. Well, let, let's take them one at a time. So let's talk about health. So health, are people gonna get sick because they're residents living in an apartment versus folks working in a warehouse or an office building? The same criteria is gonna apply. And when you look at the distances here, we're not talking about a little bit of a distance. We're talking about a lot of distance. And if there was any health issue whatsoever, you should close the community fields tomorrow. Those are the folks that are the most exposed and the ones most at risk. When you look at safety, there was some suggestion that uh, fire trucks might have difficulty getting to the uh, apartment building. I don't see for anyone that's been to that site how that would be a legitimate safety concern. Uh, you've got fire trucks that are gonna have to go across to the green development. You have some houses that are positioned pretty interestingly over there, but it seems to work. Um, there's no access issue. This building will have to be built according to the latest life safety code, which would mean sprinklers, would mean emergency exits, would mean sufficient passage for fire trucks and ambulances. The planning board is gonna insist on that on their checklist and their submittals. And the welfare of the community we can't disprove, you know, anything, everything in the world, but when you look at this from a rational basis in terms of welfare, I mean, the resident that's already living in the middle of the site, uh, no indication that their welfare has been impacted uh, by all the years that they've lived there. This will pro provide them a meaningful buffer as well. So I think looking at all the documents that have been submitted, uh, we meet that test. And, and I just remind you, and you were so articulate in the other case where you talked about uh, that test is in a marked degree, not in a little way. But I don't see absolutely any difference to health, safety, and welfare, whether you have nice people living in beautiful apartments or you have people working in a warehouse or an industrial shop. Well, that leads to the other thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, even under the Simplex standard for getting a variance, you still have to prove that there is not a, the conflict is not so great, it's just a mere conflict. And there are two, I cannot think of, I said this is the first hearing, two more incompatible uses than residential and industrial. That is a direct conflict. Um, and the, in terms of a use variance, that is, runs the risk more of spot zoning. Um, so, you know, I, I, those are concerns that I have 
Um, perhaps you can address those. Sure. I think in the abstract, when you, uh, if you're back in 26 with Euclid, Euclid and Ambler, I believe they might have said there's a distinction between industrial, whether it be the railroad and housing. Uh, I'd say exhibit A is look at downtown. You've got a pile of salt there and trucks backing up for years. Hasn't had any impact or any inconsistency with all the residential development in the inner city. Uh, people would die to be in downtown next to the salt piles and next to the docks and next to the tin. I don't know what they bring in and out of there now, but uh, I've seen the salt piles recently. And it's not pretty. And it's clearly an industrial use. And it coexists very well. The second part of your question was? That uh, when you give a use variance, it's more like spot zoning. Oh, spot zoning. Well, in that case, there'd be no need to have a ZBA or variances, right? Because almost every variance would be a spot zone. And I think that's been ad addressed and debunked by many of the commentators of the Supreme Court. And in fact, many people would tell you a variance is much better than rezoning because it gives the zoning board and the planning board controls. So if I go and ask for rezoning for mixed use or residential, that opens the floodgates to do whatever, whatever you want if you can get it passed. With the zoning board, you have controls to put conditions for indemnity on, for, for provisions to put lease terms in, provisions to put terms in for the planning board to make a determination as what's the right allocation and number of units. That's something you can't get in rezoning. I don't want to hog, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mill, then Mr. Lee. Um, I've got a, just a couple of questions. You said earlier a resident can sue for whatever reason, correct? Anyone can sue for any reason, including correct. residents, so that's a yes. And um, you are prepared as part of the lease agreement or an agreement with Pike to indemnify Pike if any resident sues them for any reason, including health. That's correct. So basically, Pike is indemnified. They're cleared. Nothing's going to happen. Um, would you do the same thing for the city? Well, it's a good question. One, the city. The has reason I ask that, if if a resident is bound and determined that they have whatever evidence, valid or not, that their suffering is caused by Pike and they're not, you know, um, they're not able to sue Pike because of their lease agreement, regardless of their challenge, they're going to come after the city because the city allowed it to happen. Good question. One, I would make a recommendation to my clients, and this is off the cuff now, and I'd, I'd need to have a minute to confer with them to see what their thoughts are. But if we got the benefit of the city's immunity for any claims, I wouldn't think that's too much of a risk. The benefit of the city's what? Immunity. Sovereign immunity? The city has immunity. I mean, you can't sue the city for zoning. Sovereign the city. immunity. You'd be getting sued all the time. So, And I know that's delegable in certain cases. So if uh, we had the benefit of the immunity, if you were worried about bootstrapping that, I would make a recommendation to do it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mr. Lee. <clears throat> that was my question also. Okay, very good. Any, anybody, any other, anything over here? No? Yeah, I, Ms. Elvis. I'm just not sure. <clears throat> when the zoning board is, has said that there were concerns about the health and safety. While we're supposed to be comforted by this indemnification, which says it may be true, but it doesn't matter to us. Because that's basically what it's saying, that if anything happens, it's on you and not on us. How is that supposed to be good news? Well, the, the good news is the first part of it, right, is the evidence that's been submitted saying that there is no impact to health, safety, and welfare. But because people are concerned about it, we want to give them extra protection so you give them an indemnity. And you don't give that lightly. That's a legal obligation uh, to provide insurance, if you will. Okay. I just Thank I don't you all find it's reassuring. 
Anybody? Fine. I, I just would like to say One, that Mr. Rossi. I, I think the indemnification is totally beside the point. Our job here is not to apportion financial responsibility for health and safety issues. Our job is to ensure that zoning decisions are made in the best interest of health and safety issues, uh, regardless of who is financially responsible for uh, any aberrations there. Uh, so I am totally bewildered by the emphasis on this uh, aspect of it, and it, I don't find it compelling. Okay. Respect Any, your opinion. Last, anybody? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> now, anybody else? Too far, too far or against? Any speakers? Come up, please. Your, your name and address, if you would. My name is Jeffrey Christensen. I'm the attorney representing Pike Industries. With me is Larry Major of Pike Industries. Um, we are the appellants in this case that asked for the rehearing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some, and actually before I get too far into that, I don't know if I need to also request additional time. Um, there's a lot to be discussed here. There's a lot of different angles here. No, so. at this at this uh, stage, there is no t there are no time limits. But we asked you to be. Sick Six, obviously to be succinct. I will be as succinct as I can. Thank you. Um, thank you. I know the board has already read our motion for rehearing. It addresses a lot of the issues, so I'll try to be brief and not rehash things that you guys already know. Um, I want to turn it over to Larry for a minute. Um, he's going to talk about what Pike Industries is doing at their site and some of the particular concerns before I bring it back to the legal aspect. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Larry Major. I'm with Pike Industries. Thank you uh, for uh, seeing us again this evening. Um, as you know, the uh, Beverly Hill Road facility uh, has been there for many, many decades. Um, that facility has supplied much of the aggregates that construction aggregates and hot mixed pavement that have gone into building this city. Um, many local families have earned their living working at that facility. Uh, it currently has uh, in the back at the large pile, that's a recycling pile where we crush concrete and um, used hot mix pavement. Um, some of the things that uh, I took a look quickly today on the internet, just typed in hot mix asphalt plant complaints. There's, you can spend a whole day reading them. And most of them arrive when, or arise when communities build in around, residences build in around those hot mix plants and then Neighbors don't like it. The neighbors like smooth roads, but they don't like living near hot mix facilities. Um, during our last public hearing, there was discussion that this neighborhood is an area in transition. The discussion even led some board members to refer to the area as a mixed use area. Um, that's an industrial zone. It is not a mixed use zone, and it's not a residential zone. The city does have mixed use zones, and it does have re residential zones, but that area is zoned industrial. Um, other businesses within that area uh, include Portsmouth's own composting, the city of Portsmouth's own composting yard, uh, ready mix concrete producer, and uh, auto repair shops. Uh, one thing that's uh, happening more frequently now is that Pike is required to work at night. Uh, the New Hampshire DOT for their interstate work and m much of the uh, state highway work is night work. The city of Portsmouth requires us to work at night quite frequently. So that brings a different dynamic to the operation because when you take away all the ambient background noise of the daytime and it gets quiet at night and you're running an asphalt plant with backup alarms and other beepers on the loaders, uh, air actuated switches that run the plant, all that stuff starts to get very loud. Um, I would say that um, with regard to the value of the asset, um, the Norwood Group's um, evaluation, I, I don't think they really understand the, the real cost and the real uh, value of a hot mix asphalt plant. So I don't know that that's germane to this, uh, to this discussion. And that is all I had, because I know you want to be brief. Any, any questions for the speaker? No? Apparently not. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the, one of the fundamental aspects of zoning and a zoning ordinance is to segregate incompatible uses. Nobody wants an asphalt plant in the middle of a residential neighborhood the same way that having a residence in the middle of an industrial area is going to cause problems. There's good reasons to segregate these uses. 
it protects the residents from the industrial side effects, noise, air quality, traffic, health and safety concerns, but it also protects, protects the industrial uses from the concerns of being, have, having residences next door. And I recognize, you know, we talked a little bit about what those risks are with the indemnity agreement and all of that, but just being sued by the neighbors is not the only risk. You've got neighbors who are just calling to complain, calling the city to complain. You, you can't indemnify against just the administrative burden of neighbors being unhappy with you. Anything that Pike needed to do to show up and ask for the city's approval for anything they wanted to do, well, now their neighbors aren't other industrial uses, now their neighbors are 60 residential units that have to sleep next door to whatever they want to do. All of those concerns can't simply be addressed by an indemnity or a lease provision that's in a lengthy lease that I suspect a lot of tenants aren't reading. It's also important to preserve land for various uses. Having industrial uses in Portsmouth in the area is very important to support all of the other uses, all of the other activities of civilization, having paved roads. It's a lot better for the city to have a plant nearby that can provide these supplies, provide these resources, rather than trying to ship them in from somewhere else after industrial uses got crowded out because everybody said a residence would be more valuable on my industrial property than industrial uses. If you start using residential pro industrial property for residential uses, A, you lose that property itself, but also it makes the other industrial properties in the area less appealing. And then they don't want to be there, they move somewhere else as well, and it crowds them out. These are all good reasons for segregating these uses in the zoning ordinance. I do want to address a couple of the comparisons that have been made, the nearby recreational fields. This is a very apples and orange comparison. Recreational uses are very different than industrial uses. Nobody's trying to sleep on those recreational fields. Nobody's trying to have a quiet dinner with their family, have the windows open, enjoy the nice autumn air while a truck is going by, beeping on the recreational fields. You have risks of, in residences, children that just live there. And I know the abutter or the applicant said that there was only going to be three children in this building. There's no way to guarantee that. But regardless, there's a different risk for residential uses. A child that says, hey, I'm going to go outside my home and play outside and wander the 15 feet to the gravel pit is very different than somebody saying, hey, I'm in the middle of a football game. I'm going to hop the fence and go into the gravel pit. Those are two very different uses. Similarly, the across the street residential area of Banfield, across Banfield Road, that's a single family residential dwelling, a lot less dense. It's separated by a road, woods. That is a very different unit than having 60 residential apartments 15 feet from the gravel pit. And I know there's a lot of discussion of, oh, it's 1,000 feet to Pike's driveway and all of that, but the gravel pit is right there. If you walk through the woods, it's right there. So I want to touch on those five elements that we've been talking about for the variance application briefly. And again, I know that you've all read our motion for rehearing. There's going to be a lot of overlap, so, but um, I do want to address the highlights. And starting with the big one, the unnecessary hardship. The first aspect of that is, are there <clears throat> special conditions of this property that are not shared by other properties in the area? A lot of this discussion of, well, is this a mixed-use area? There's recreational fields next door. There's you know, residences across the street. Those are all shared by every property in this area. All of these have the recreational fields there, but all of them are near Banfield Road. If that's true for this property, it's true for all of them. And that suggests, well, this is a decision for rezoning, not that your property is unusual to other properties in the area such that you need a variance. There's no unique condition, no unusual condition, no special condition that makes a residential use more appropriate on this property than on the other properties. Could you rezone the whole area, take away all the industrial uses, and would residences there be great? 
well, sure, if you're okay losing industrial uses, but there's, again, there's reasons for segregating these uses. There's reasons for dedicating land for industrial uses. Even if that were the case, even if you say, look, we do think there are special conditions, we do think there's good reasons for this here, you have that second element of is there a fair and substantial relationship between the purposes of zoning and the prohibition on a residence on this property? And again, I, I've gone over those all in depth. I'm, I'm not going to rehash them here, but all of those reasons for, keep, for when this zoning ordinance was written <clears throat> for prohibiting residential uses there, all of those are applicable here. The risks to the residents, the burdens on the industrial use, preserving the industrial space. The other big one is the property value element. Now, Pike has told you multiple times, if they knew that there was a 60-unit residence right next door, they would be less interested in this property if they were purchasing it for the first time. The same concern is true of any prospective purchaser from Pike. If some Pike is going to sell this property and somebody's going to come look at it and go, oh, geez, there's 60 people who live next door who are going to complain every time there's noise, who are going to complain about you know, whatever happens that I want to do with this property, I'm just going to buy property somewhere else, or maybe I'll buy this property, but I'm going to buy it for less, and that's diminished value. There was that Norwood uh, letter that the applicant submitted. I think a lot of the assumptions that are made in there about risk, about the different risk and you know, the health and safety concerns, those are questionable. The board is not required to accept that letter at face value and just treat it as gospel. The board is entitled to make its own judgment on what it thinks is correct. And Pike's here to tell you that it wouldn't have paid as much for this property if that 60 unit residence was right next door. And I, I do want to touch on that letter briefly because it did mention, well, if there's any risk, the recreational fields are a greater risk. And, and we heard that a lot during the applicant's presentation, that whatever risk there is, there's more risk to the recreational field, so there's no harm in the residents. But that's not exactly true, and it doesn't hold up logically. If we assume that there are risks associated with the residential or with the recreational fields, that doesn't mean that there's no risk with the residents, and certainly adding more risk is is not the solution to risk. I do want to touch on the uh, public interest and spirit of the ordinance. Um, one standard set by the court is whether this is going to alter the essential character of the neighborhood. That's almost inherent. The essential character of this area is industrial. There's a residential district nearby, sure. It won't alter the character of a residential district elsewhere. But this particular area, it will alter that characteristic. <clears throat> All of the industrial uses in the area are now going to have to say, if I do this, am I going to have 60 angry neighbors calling me, calling the city, complaining about me, posting things <clears throat> online, disparaging me, or just complaining about me, ruining my goodwill with the community? Nobody wants that. Um, we've talked a lot about the health and safety, all those. I, I'm not going to spend more time on those right now. Um, I do want to talk about the substantial justice element, though, and this argument about, well, we need housing. And certainly there is a housing shortage. There's a housing shortage all over the state, all over the country. But that doesn't mean we should just start building residences anywhere that there's empty space that we can build them. It's the zoning board's role to make sure that development of the city is undertaken with due care, thoughtfully, carefully, and making sure that everything is done so that you're not mixing incompatible uses, you're not creating more harms than you're getting for benefits. Putting a residential use in the middle of an industrial zone is going to create a lot of problems. Putting a residential use in a neighborhood that's more suitable for a residential use. You've got mixed uses downtown, you know, commercial on the first floor, residences above it, great. But next to an asphalt plant is not the place to put a residential unit. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions the board might have. Otherwise, you've heard a lot from me already, and I think you've heard enough. <laughs> Mr. Lee. I made the, uh, the comparison the last meeting that this was in a transitional zone, mm -hmm. and 
I revisited that again, and I still have that uh, uh, opinion. You know, when I, where I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, we lived in a little six-acre farm. It was about a mile of the nearest house. One day a bulldozer came come along, and all of a sudden there's houses all around. And so on Banfield Road, and when the pipe plant was built mm -hmm. some time ago, that's probably one of the few things that were out there. But in 1981, they built a house at 285 Banfield. In 2001, they built a house at 2001 Banfield. In 2001, they built a house at 261 Banfield. In 2018, this board gave a variance to build St. Patrick's Academy out there. Mm -hmm. There's a new residential uh, development, as you said, across the road. So I still maintain that that is a transitional area, even though the, the overall zoning is industrial. Mm -hmm. I think that that is, again, truly a transitional area and is becoming more transitional as time goes on. So, so that's a question of scale and scope. How broadly do you want to look at it? I mean, certainly all of New Hampshire is transitioning from when it was heavily mills. If you zoom out and go out from the district and look at the residential district, sure, there's residential uses in the residential district. The fact that the residences and uses are spreading out from the city, city is growing, makes it all the more important to preserve the areas that are dedicated to industrial use and not drive out the industrial uses that the city needs to be building all of those houses. Also, it is important to keep in mind that a school, a recreational field, those are all very different than a residence. You don't have people sleeping there. You don't have people trying to raise infants there, complaining about, well, the noise of the trucks woke my infant up. Those are very different. That's also worth keeping in mind. So just kind of touching on the athletic fields for a moment, I did the site walk on the property as well and walked all the way around the property there seems to be a, a six-foot-tall chain-link fence all around the pipe property, which would, mm -hmm. in my opinion, prevent anybody from wandering on the property. You have to really want to go on that property to, mm -hmm. to get there. But the point is, on the athletic fields, you have young athletes down there competing. And I, it's been a while since I've done any competing at any level, but <laughs> one thing I notice when you're competing in sports, you breathe a lot heavier than you do normally. Yep. So the, the, the athletic fields are literally a rock throwing distance away from the, uh, mm -hmm. the bulk pile there where they store asphalt. And I was out there again today watching them uh, operate in there, and they had a front end loader that was loading a dump truck and a conveyor belt thing that was you know, tra uh, moving some asphalt product. Mm -hmm. And I really, it's, it's, you know, it's certainly there, and it's, you have to look up to see it because it's pretty massive. But I didn't really notice any, you know, noxious odors or whatever. And I think if I were playing football, <coughs> soccer, whatever, out on that field, that that uh, I would probably not be in any health danger to to be there. So. I don't think there's any health danger that Pike is outputting into the atmosphere. One of our primary concerns is noise more than air quality. But it is also worth keeping in mind the difference of somebody on the field for a couple hours on a Saturday playing a game and somebody who's living there every day year round trying to sleep there. Again, noise is a larger concern of ours than air quality. But everybody has a different concern. Everybody has a different level. You know, maybe the air quality is safe, but you just don't like the smell. Whatever it happens to be, again, you put up with it for an hour when you're playing your sports game. Are you going to put up with it when you have a new child and you're con a concerned new parent? And, well, you know what? I'd really rather them not be there. Maybe I can get the city to drive them out. If I call them enough, if I make enough noise, maybe I'll convince them to leave. And it's also worth keeping in mind whether or not that actually happens is not the only problem. Maybe the residents in there are all perfectly fine, but the risk of it happening is also going to diminish the property value because a potential purchaser of the Pike property is not going to know that every resident in that apartment is a stand-up splendid person. They're not going to know that every future resident is going to be great. So the concern that, well, there's 60 units there, 60 people who might be complaining, is just going to lead potential purchasers to be less interested in this property and to diminish the value of it. <clears throat> so, 
Any, anybody else over here? I have a couple of points too. Anybody else? No? Uh, you, you've, you've made the argument over and over again that these two uses are side by side and they're therefore incompatible. So you're talking about a buffer zone of some kind without using, the, without using in that term. In your knowledge of New Hampshire law, is there any such thing at what defines a buffer zone that you can't have use A versus next use B unless you have a car at a, so many feet between them? Is there, is there anything that defines what the, the there, separation should that you, you, you your argument there has to be a separation, but you're not saying what's it based on and how big does it have to be? Well, so there's there's no inherent requirement when a city is enacting a zoning ordinance that they can't put an industrial zone within this range of a residential zone. That's sort of up to the discretion of the city when they're originally designing this. And the city did make that decision when it put a residential zone across the street and kept the industrial zone on this side. But there was a reason that they did say this zone should be just industrial. And putting it in the middle of that industrial zone is a very different issue than, well, should we have a residential zone near an industrial zone? What about the properties that are on the edge? At a certain point, you do have to accept risks of there being other properties. But there is a reason that this property, this area was dedicated exclusively to industrial, and there is nothing about this property that makes it different than the other properties in the industrial zone that justifies granting the variance to be treated differently from the other properties. And that's the question for a variance. Should the zoning ordinance have been rewritten from the beginning is a question beyond me. Okay, but you're not making that up. To my ears, you're not making that argument. No, let me, not at let all. me also let me address another question. There's been much made of the fact that this is precious industrial land in it. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's been vacant for decades, long, 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 long time, if this was so precious, it, don't you think at some point it might have been that enough money would appear to in, develop it as an industri for an industrial use? Well, I, I'm not speaking solely of the, the land underneath where this apartment building is going to be. I'm speaking of the Pike property and the other industrial properties around it that are going to be deterred from continuing, are going to mm -hmm. be diminished in their value from selling to somebody else. A new purchaser is not going to want to come in and buy these properties if there's a residential use right there 15 feet away from the property line. Those are the concerns where a residential use will not only crowd out this particular property, which has had a industrial use on it, but will also have a chilling effect on the surrounding properties that will either discontinue their development, will scale down, will not have people interested in purchasing the property down the line, or will have 60 residences next door saying, hey, we're trying to encourage people to not build industrial units right there, not continue industrial uses. If you ask those 60 units, would you like the Pike property to be sold to another asphalt plant, or would you like somebody to buy it, discontinue it, and turn it into more apartment buildings? I'm sure they'd love for it to be turned into more apartment buildings. And then you're going to chase Pike out and the other industrial uses in the area because you have 60 people who are trying to get rid of the industrial uses. Okay, I would also point out that there, there's hardly a lack of industrial zone property in the city, right up the street on Banfield Road on the corner of Constitution between, right in that area, mm -hmm. there's acres and acres of trees that have been zoned industrial for decades and nobody has swooped in there and decided that was so valu valuable as industrial land that they should put something there. So that, that argument that that this industrial zone, we shouldn't use this for a residential because someday somebody might want to put something industrial on it. It doesn't hold water when there's all, right in the same neighborhood, right up the street, there's a considerable amount of vacant industrial land. That's all, that's my point. Yeah, it, it's, it's more about preserving the industri industrial uses that are already there and protecting their, continue, their ability to continue to operate. Okay, let me, let me make another final point that I, I don't think has been addressed. And that's the fact that we're talking as though the people who potentially would be tenants at this 60-unit 
apartment building are somehow going to be forced to get there. They're going to be adults. They're going to make a reasoned decision in their own mind to move in to an area that's not, not exactly prime residential property. Let's say you're on a street that's quite a walk to downtown without sidewalks, mm -hmm. you know, and there's other things that are going to make it less desirable and therefore lower in rent than other properties and that and I don't I'm, I'm just not sure that it's in the city's the city is in the business of telling people where they can live and where they can't live and one final related point is that I relate to my over 18 years experience as a landlord in the fine city of Portsmouth mm -hmm. with one two and three bedroom apartments and the interest over 18 years in one bedroom apartments which I had of which I had quite a few with people with children was zero there is simply not room. I mean, that's pretty ob it's pretty obvious, isn't it? So the argument that uh, this is going to be a, an attraction to children, and heaven forbid the children want to go out there, and the parents are ignoring them, and they're going to climb in, climb into the, uh, climb the fence and get into the pike properties, just seems far fetched to me. So I, those those sort of arguments, based on my experience, I, I, I just don't don't measure up. That's that's all. Well, your experience as a landlord is different than mine. Then I, I've definitely seen one-bedroom apartments with with children in them. Um, but I, I do want to touch on one point you just made: that the city is not in the business of telling people where they can and cannot live. That's exactly what a zoning ordinance does: is it says this is the area that's dedicated for residential use, this is the area that's dedicated for mixed use, commercial use, and this area is dedicated for industrial use. And it wouldn't be the first time that somebody moved into an apartment thinking that they liked the area and then discovered that their neighbor was not exactly what they were expecting and suddenly deciding after they've moved there that they didn't like the neighbor after all. If they go by and look at the property during the day, as Attorney Cronin did, and said, well, you know, it's not that noisy. But you also heard Larry Major talk about how a lot of Pike Industries, they're being required to do their work at night. Somebody goes, looks at the apartment, says, you know what, yeah, it's not that bad. It's a good price, I'll move in. And then when they've signed the lease, then when they move in, then when they start sleeping there, they go, oh, you know what, that's noisier than I thought. I'm gonna complain about the noise. Things change. Pike Industries says, you know what, we have to change our schedule, we have to change the scope, the nature of our work. And what was tolerable to the tenant becomes intolerable because it changed or the tenant has a spouse move in and the spouse doesn't like it or they have a kid and now with the kid you know well it was fine for me but it's keeping my child up or my child doesn't like the smell or whatever you're dealing with things change after you move into an apartment and the fact that they will know that pike industry is there doesn't solve all of the concerns the same way a disclaimer in the lease doesn't solve all of the concerns all right, but you haven't signed a 30-year mortgage, so you, <laughs> you, I think you're making my point. Thank, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody? For, anything further? No? We, have we beat this enough? <laughs> okay, so, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, what's next? Two more. Any other, two, any, other, any other comment? Two for or against? Yeah, please come up. So my name is Jarrett Temple. <clears throat> I work for Wholesome, formerly Aggregate Industries, and we have a ready mix concrete batch plant right next to Pike Industries at 650 Beverly Hill. Uh, we did not receive <clears throat> notice of this initial meeting. Uh, we moved our offices from uh, Saugus, Mass to Middleton, Mass this spring, and I'm assuming that it got lost in the shuffle, or I would have been here. Uh, to be heard in the first meeting. So I apologize for that, but I'm okay. grateful for your rehearing. Um, I just wanted to, I sent a letter to the board and, and I decided I'm, I'm not gonna read it. Uh, Jeff said everything that I could possibly say and he probably said it better. Uh, he'll probably even sell me a bill for mentioning his name. But I wanna address one thing um, about a comment you just made about the 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 value of the industrial property, it's not so much the value of the property, it's about the value of the businesses in this industry that are there. Um, a lot of the work that gets done at these properties, they make our roads, our bridges, right? They make 
these buildings, sidewalks, it's everywhere you look. <clears throat> and a lot of projects that we work on now are done at night. And they are done at night actually to make it easier for us to get to work so that we're not clogging up the freeways during you know, high volume traffic times. So a lot of times we're operating 24 hours to fill concrete to a, an airport job or to a highway. I mean, you name it, we do it. So I'm, I, I want to back up uh, the point that, that Mr. Major made. Um, the very important businesses, and, and in this area that is industrial, if more residential homes are built, you're going to you'll see what happens. It'll force the industrial area, it'll make it too hard for us to operate, and you'll still need these businesses, but you'll have to push them out. And the farther they get away, the more expensive they get. And so concrete, ready mix concrete, this is not a, a, a product that you, can, that you can make and store and inventory and then ship anywhere. You have to get it to its destination in a certain amount of time or they'll reject it. It's no longer good. So you need ready mix concrete in this area, in this close proximity to the city as much as you need hot mix asphalt. So I'm not going to belabor the points anymore, but I wanted to drive that home because when, when I listened to you speak, I understood your point, but I think you were missing Jeff's point where it is really hard to recreate these businesses somewhere else. And in today's permitting atmosphere and environment, it can be nearly impossible. I know a number of companies trying to get new plants built in places that need ready mix concrete and hot mix asphalt, and they can't get it done because the, they're opposed by the residential communities nearby. So that's it. Um, in, in the spirit of everyone's time, uh, that's all I have to say. Yeah, any, any questions? Yeah, yes, Mr. Lee. So where, how do you access your property in relation to this? To so to we're, we share roadway with Pike. Okay, so not off Banfield Road, though. It's off Beverly Hill Road? Correct. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Thank you very much. Uh, next, next speakers, please. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Rick Beckstead, 1395 Lisbon Street. Um, I was sitting at home. Um, I was actually calling in for the next application, not for this one. Uh, not really, I guess, understanding as far as the rehearing. I do know the applicant well. He is well renowned in the community. His family has been here forever, born and raised. Uh, they, when you say Richie, you're a Portsman, period. <laughs> but as I watched the last, uh, uh, I guess, application that had come through and it got an approval and then rehearing um, and then listening to the attorney tonight, I, I, I felt compelled to come down and just let the board know a couple of things. Uh, one of the concerns is the multipurpose fields. I mean, I've been around it since day one with the multi-purpose fields from when it was planned to when it was built to where it's monitored. And it is monitored, and I actually asked the city attorney, the air quality there, because it was a concern, is monitored. And we've had no problems, no spikes, no anything. So it's clear with that. The difference between, and the other attorney had gone and said it best, is living year-round and then partial use during field and exercises and stuff like that. That's a completely different use. And I'll use an example of those type of uses, peas in the PDA. Now, a family had gone and started building when the PDA was formed, and we closed our base. And they started with a couple of hotels. How many hotels are out there now after they were built? Not, because it's a super fun site. We can go out there, we can work, but you can't live there. And that's one of the reasons why you're never going to have living there. It's separation. There are things you can and can't do when it comes to land. Another perfect example is we have a gas station on Islington Street. To get a gas station, been an eyesore for the 40 years of my life that I've been here. What nobody knows is there are actually restrictions on that property. Because of the, air, because of the soil quality that's underneath there, you cannot build a living residence. That's why it's a gas station. That's why the argument has been made and is being made again right now to be able to go and put a restaurant there. It's a partial use. We have land all around the city that have those partial uses. This is one of those ones. It should not. To go and, and subject 60 possible people 
to quality of life, not just noise and use and everything, but qual who's responsible? <clears throat> I wouldn't want to be. I wouldn't. I, I know none of you would want to be responsible. What would you do with yourselves? And again, I don't want to use this as an argument to deny, but 10 years from now, there's another cancer cluster or something that goes on because of the quality. You know, Pike has been there forever. I mean, most of my life that I've been here, there has been no residents. There, there are some that are around there, but it's small quantities. The one across the street is a small quantity. I still didn't agree with it, but it, at least it has that separation that has been talked about. Mr. Chair, you had just gone and talked about um, people as far as with, I, I tried to give an example of uh, people complaining, you know, as far as with things being built and stuff like that. From day one, when the first couple of residents moved into to Cass Street along the railroad, now when they were showing, I've actually talked with some people that have bought those, and they were told by the realtors that one or two trains a week, a week, go through there. Those people that are there, and it's still not full yet, are complaining about the trains that go there every day, and we all know that Pan Am can do what it wants, when it wants. There has to be that separation. We have to have that equality. Um, and, and I guess the last thing, again, I'm, I, I don't want to get into this any further, is the attorney had gone and talked about, I, I, I fought for nine years, build more housing, the prices will go down. Been hearing it for years, been hearing it for, through counselors. It hasn't happened. The reverse has actually happened. If I own a 1,500 square foot home and a 1,500 square foot brand new home down the street is built, it's based on square footage. It's not a matter whether I have a new dishwasher or I have granite countertop, it's square footage because you can upgrade those square footages. That argument is false. Building more rental units has not helped the city lower the costs of rentals in this city. So that, that it's a false argument. I just, I felt and compelled that I needed to go and say it and I needed to say it in person to you, which I all believe you're doing a fab fabulous job as opposed to going and do it on Zoom. So thank you very much for your time, Chair and the Board, and good night. Hey, thank you very much. You. Next, next speaker, please. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Will Arvella for the record. I'm the executive director of Crossroads House. I'm not fortunate enough to live in Portsmouth, but I live in Newfields. Um, but I, I want to speak to the issue of, um, of uh, this particular uh, development, but also more generally about the issue of access to workforce housing, um, and more specifically also to low-income housing. But but I'm here as an advocate of all housing, and I think that um, I'll start by saying that you know, I, you know, fortunate or unfortunate, I grew up in New York City, and and uh, I've been in this great state for 15 years. But uh, if you have ever lived in New York City, uh, you know that uh, zoning and residential kind of are on top of each other. And uh, I lived in the projects in New York City. Uh, right up against Park Avenue, where you have Amtrak and you have uh, uh, um, New York Excuse City me, Metro. Excuse me, please, please keep your comments to the, to this project. That would be very yeah, helpful. And, uh, it, and, I, it, and I think I mentioned that earlier. Okay. Yeah. So, so the issue is basically that uh, zoning is defined by a locality, and um, there are places where z uh, industrial and residential coexist very happily. Um, I, I do want to say that we, um, I, I disagree with the comments of the, of the former speaker. I, I do believe that we do have to continue to build housing if we're going to maintain a healthy community. And that uh, is all types of housing. You know, hopefully uh, we get to the point where we're building more low income housing. Uh, we're now building medium, medium cost housing and higher cost housing. Eventually, we will get to the point where we have enough housing that things hopefully will even out. But I work with residents that don't currently have access to housing. I mean, so that that is a major issue for us and our staff. And uh, I know that uh, Jay McSherry was here earlier. He had to leave, and I believe he was going to speak in favor of this project. But he owns a whole series of restaurants in the city of Portsmouth. He cannot find housing for his staff. Um, so. You have to look at that as well from from the perspective that 
if we're going to maintain a healthy economy, a healthy Portsmouth community, you have to, or we have to figure out how we're going to continue to add housing of all types to the housing stock in, in the city. And, and um, so that's all I'll say, but, uh, and, and I do favor this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next speaker, please. Hi, good evening. My name is Mimi Wheeler. I'm the executive director of the Chase Home, um, and I am here in favor of this project. Um, I currently work with 32 staff members, and only one of them lives in Portsmouth. Um, we definitely need more housing. It would be great to have more staff members closer to where they work, um, and I think it would be, be beneficial to the home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, next speaker, please. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Right. Try to speak in the end if you can. Yeah. Sure. Uh, good evening. My name is Christian Stahlkamp. I live in Portsmouth with my wife and three children uh, for the past over 15 years. I also work in commercial real estate here in town for the past 15 plus years. We're generalists. Most of our commercial brokers up here are generalists. That means we work industrial, office, retail, mixed use. What I'm hearing across the board when I talk to businesses, the biggest issue that they're having is finding places for their employees to live. And it's interesting to see how these companies look at that as a major determinant of whether to be in the city or in, and stay in the city. Um, last year, working with a tech company, they left. They went to Texas. They tried to run around to try to find enough uh, employees. They couldn't find the employees. They are having trouble having those employees living in Portsmouth and the commute from other outs outstanding um, communities. So the challenge is trying to find housing. I support this use uh, variance and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, anybody else? Any, anybody else? Last call, two for or against? Apparently not. Okay, we'll close, we'll close the hearing. There we are, okay. All right, board. What's your what's your pleasure? Well, I, <clears throat> I don't mind speaking first. Uh, I will not be supporting this variance uh, because I do not believe it meets all of the criteria required, uh, particularly uh, with regard to the first and second, uh, and be, not being contrary to the public interest or the spirit of the ordinance. Uh, I am particularly swayed by the letter that we received from. Uh, the Department of Health of Portsmouth. Uh, these are the experts who are best positioned to opine on whether or not there would be a future health hazard for residents in the proposed development. And uh, I give them uh, extraordinary weight in my uh, determination that, or my opinion, that uh, this would not be in the interest of public health. It would be contrary. Okay, thank you. Any, who's, who's next? Ms. Mr. Lee. I'd just like to read RSA 674-33. It says, this does not require an, in, an investigation of how severely the zoning restriction interferes with the owner's use of the land. It merely requires a determination that owing to special conditions of the property, proposed use is reasonable. <clears throat> necessarily a subjective judgment, as is almost everything having to do with variances. But presumably it includes an analysis of how the proposed use would affect neighboring properties and the municipality's zoning goals generally. It clearly includes, quote, whether the landowner's proposed use would alter the essential character of the neighborhood. And I would again submit that it doesn't. And I read uh, Mrs. McNamara's letter from the Health Department, and I really find nothing in there that says it there is a safety issue. It says several times there may be a safety issue. And uh, may be and is is two different things in my book. So I would once again be in support of this application. Okay. Uh, who's, who's, who's next on com initial comments? Anybody? No? No? Uh, Ms. Margeson. Um, uh, no surprise because I didn't vote for the original variance request, but I will not be supporting this. Um, <clears throat> 
I think in particular uh, the uh, what Mr. Rossi said about the uh, spirit and intent of the ordinance. Um, I think that there is significant uh, health, safety, and welfare issues here. The uh, Ms. McNamara's letter brought up several of those. They have not been addressed by the applicant, by Mr. Ritchie, respectfully. Um, also, I do not see hardship. Um, I think uh, this is, well, in terms of um, there is more than a mere conflict with the zoning ordinances. It's to a marked degree very conflicted with the zoning ordinance. Um, the you need to separate residential and industrial uses. Um, so I, I will not be supporting this. Okay. And it, who's, who's next? Anybody? <laughs> no. Maybe we okay. should do it. Ms. Eldridge. I did support this last time. And I did it with some hesitation, but I feel like tonight I have learned things that I didn't know before. And one of those, in my opinion, has changed. I cannot support this. And one of the things that's changed it is Kim McNamara's letter. Um, no, she didn't say absolutely a disaster is going to happen here. But I think that her view of it is that this isn't a healthy environment. And the other thing that changed my mind is learning more about the night operations. And we know that noise is a big factor in you know, mental health and contentment and fumes and noises, not the way you want to be living with huge trucks going next door. And I know people can choose to live wherever they want. I agree with you. But sometimes maybe we have to be a little more protective. And maybe it is in transition. But right now, this will absolutely change the essential character of this neighborhood. So. I'm not going to be able to support this proposal. All right, thank you. Uh, any anybody else? Last call up for the board to speak. Is is someone uh, ready to make a motion? Mr. Mr. Lee, <clears throat> I will once again move that we uh, approve this application as presented and advertised. Okay. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Anybody? Second. All right. I'll. <laughs> I'll, I'll second the motion so we can move along. Right. Your motion, please. All right. We're getting out my handy-dandy new variance criteria thingy here. <laughs> uh, section 10.233-21, granting the variance would not be contrary to public interest. I find that it would not be. And tying that together with 10.233-22, granting the variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance, I find that would be the case as well. And again, I maintain that this area is not a pure industrial zone. It is a transitional zone. You can look around. There are residences on Banfield Road. There is a the sports field literally within rock throwing distance of Pike Industries. There's 20 new houses across the street. And again, in 1930, this was probably a very isolated area when that was when the park facility was built. That's not the case now. We have St. Patrick's Academy, which this board granted a variance to in 2018, and uh, no, no, uh, no outcry from the park people at that time about the, the dangers of that. So again, that to me proves my point that this is a transitional zone, not a pure industrial zone. Uh, Moving on to 10.233-23, granting the variance would do substantial justice. And let's see, let me get my thing here. Substantial justice. Benefit to the applicant will not be outweighed by harm to the general public or other individuals. Number uh, 210-233-24, granting the variance would not diminish the values of surrounding properties. We have statements from several experts in the field that deal in commercial and industrial real estate that this would not diminish the value of the surrounding properties. Being a realtor myself, I can I do agree with that. So I find that that uh, thing is that point is correct, and that would be yes. Two th ten dash two three three dash two five. Literal enforcement of the provisions would result in an unnecessary hardship. This is so. 
This property has special conditions that distinguish it. Or owing to these special conditions, the property can't be reasonably used in strict conformance with the ordinance. So the special conditions here would be that they're looking to build a uh, residential project in a, an industrial slash transitional zone. So because of that, it can't be reasonably used in strict conformance with the ordinance. And a variance is therefore necessary to enable a reasonable use of it. All right. Very good. Your second. Uh, you second. Second. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I went. I did that last. Week. There's no second down here. <laughs> so, sorry. I, I remember your comments, <laughs> Mr. Mano. No, you seconded. No, that's right. I did. Sorry. <laughs> we have the regular seconders. All right. I have. I agree with Mr. Lee and have nothing to add except that my firm belief that the people who are likely to rent in that property are making a, a value judgment as adults on their own best interests, it, and as was well pointed out, and based on my experience as a landlord and a manager, uh, some of them might not work out. That's true. But somebody is willing to invest the money in Portsmouth to create badly needed housing. There's no disagreement over that. <clears throat> At the lower end of the likely lower end of the uh, rent scale, and and every and anybody and there tends to be a tendo, uh, turnover in that kind of properties also. So nobody's going to be living there for uh, very unlikely for a, an extended period of time, which also would uh, mitigate any adverse potential adverse health effects. So that's another factor. So anyway, that's the, that's that's my view of it. So <laughs> having said that. Uh, the motion is to grant uh, Mr. Rossi. No. Okay. Ms. Eldridge. No. Ms. Ms. Margison. No. Okay. Mr. Lee. Yes. Mr. Mantle. No. And I vote yes. So the uh, motion to grant fails. So <clears throat> here we are. And it's past, it's past our break time. So we are adjourned for five. Do, no. Do you want to, um, just yeah. for the sake of this new legislation, yeah. it might be good to have a, another motion to, if there's going to be a motion to deny and right. state why. I mean, our okay, I, I, rules I, and regulations state that if um, a subsequent motion fails to receive four votes, the chair will solicit comments for the record from those board members who voted against the motion to approve so as to document how the request failed to meet all the criteria necessary to grant it. Um, okay. We could do that or... Let's do that. You could... Uh, if, uh, right. I, if that's okay with the chairman, that's, I think that's, that's the easiest way. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, I did not... Uh, well, first of all, I would cite as the overarching fact uh, to be contained in the record, uh, the letter from Kim McNamara, the director of the Portsmouth Health Department, outlining her view of the health hazards associated uh, with the proposed development. Uh, I take her as the expert whose uh, authority and knowledge on this matter uh, supersedes any opinions that we might have about it uh, on the board. And because of that, uh, I find that uh, this does not satisfy uh, the requirement for the variance not to be public, uh, contrary to the public interest or contrary to the spirit uh, of the ordinance because that is defined as uh, the proposed use must not conflict with the explicit or implicit purpose of the ordinance and must not uh, alter the essential character of the neighborhood, threaten public health, safety, or welfare, or otherwise injure uh, public rights. So uh, based on this letter, I find that it would potentially threaten public health and welfare and therefore cannot support the variance. Okay, thank you. Any, anybody, any other no's wish to uh, provide some further? Y yes, Ms. Marjorie. So, and I, I would add that um, the um, proposed variance <laughs> should not merely conflict with the ordinance. I mean, it must not unduly into a market degree to conflict with the ordinance. Um, this is a ordinance for residential use in an industrial area, um, and that is a complete and total conflict 
with the industrial zoning of the area. Um, the other thing that I would say is that the I agree with Mr. Rossi with um, Ms. McNamara's, which I don't believe that we've ever received any kind of letter like this about her concerns about um, possible health consequences to um, people living in this building um, and uh, you know that the health department uh, weighed in on it I take very seriously I don't certainly agree with everything I'm not going to take staff recommendations on every single matter but um, I do think that her concerns are well stated um, I think it's concerning that we would think about putting people who don't have as much money to spend on rent smack dab in an industrial area um, but uh, and also in terms of hardship um, uh, Mr. Ritchie is trying to create affordable housing or more affordable housing for the city I understand that but part of the property is he's still going to be using for industrial use um, he has not demonstrated that he cannot use the rest of his property for industrial use so I don't think that there are special conditions thank you Mr. Mantle I'll wait till Peter's wait, done writing. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. 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 He's too. I got it. You ready? Yeah. Um, I would add that um, 10.233.24, granting the variance, would not diminish the values of surrounding property. That may be true, except for one property, Pike Industries. Um, I think they made a compelling case that. It's an ongoing industrial property, ready mix and asphalt, that if they were going to sell it to another um, owner to do the exact same thing, and them seeing an apartment building at the end of the property next to their disposal pits, for lack of a better term, your waste pits, uh, would bring down the, bring down the offer substantially because they would have to deal with that residential area now whether the residents make a squawk or not I mean that's speculative but for somebody buying that property as an ongoing industrial use that's going to be an issue for them so throw that in there thank you Any, anybody else last <clears throat> last call no. good any new we all set. Have, yeah. Is that, is that, that enough? That should be sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'll more be than, honest. I, he said more than enough. Yeah, yeah. I found that this application almost d did not meet any of the five criteria. So. <laughs> I just have one. That's why we have votes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're okay. done for five. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're adjourned for five, no more than ten minutes.
Dave, but I didn't hear you. an alternate tonight. Dave McDonald. He didn't tell you he wasn't. Well, there. welcome back, everyone. We're, we're in, back in session. For an alternate. And we uh, are ready to proceed with the next item of old business. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which is the, as soon as I get the thing on the proper thing here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we are at 1344 and 1346 Islington Street. And where is that? Why can't I? Should be under the first item under new business. Oh, I'm, no, 64 Haven Road. Something. Excuse a second. We, something got. Out of order on the agenda here. Yeah, this is the wrong agenda. Okay. Well, I got to have the new agenda. Okay, there we are. All right. <clears throat> so this. Okay, thank you. Under new. I was using an old agenda. Under new business, we have the request of Jessica Tia Nashal, please correct my pronunciation, owner. For property located at 1344 and 1346 Islington Street, whereas relief is needed to construct a new deck and add a t an attached garage, which requires the following. One, variances from section 10.521 to allow a, a 28 foot rear yard with a deck for the deck where 30 feet is required. B, a two foot left side yard where 10 feet is required for the garage and C, a variance from section 10.521 to allow 30% building coverage where 20% is the maximum allowed. Said property is located on Assessor Map 233 as lot 98 and lies within the single residence B SRB district. Who presents this project, please? Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Jeff Dominguez. I'm the project manager of Alpha Contracting Service, and I represent the applicant. Thank you. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Opuya and their daughter and son, Kathy and John, they bought this house last April, and they are renovating the interior and exterior of the entire house. So we've been working with them. And um, so if we can locate, oh, there is there, for the garage plan. Um, as there are uh, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Oprey are a senior citizen, they would like to have the garage so they can uh, have their cars protected the snow. And also the uh, John and Kathy have a little boy and a newborn that was just born last Labor Day. So it would be great to have uh, a garage so they can enter and exit the car once they have to use the car during the winter. So that would be one of the reasons and the main reason to have the garage. And uh, also all the, uh, the neighborhood has garages as uh, well. So it's not gonna be something that just having their uh, garage there. So we, uh, they also speak with the, uh, with the neighbor and uh, it seems to be fine with the distance because we're gonna be about two to three feet from the line for the proper line of the, the neighbor on the side for the garage. So that's the first point of the garage. And uh, also uh, for, let's see here, sorry. For the point uh, B, it's, uh, it's gonna be the deck. The pre, uh, prior to this, they used to have two small decks from each side of the duplex, as a duplex. And uh, so they decided to have one single deck uh, in the backyard so they can uh, share meals together and also if they have to move any stuff between the, the apartments or the house. Also, uh, Mr. Mrs. Opuya is gonna be helping taking care of the kids. So it'll be easy to have the kids going from their house to the, the, the grandma's house. So it should be, have a better access to them and where they have to spend more time together on the deck. Also, I, I saw here that uh, it was mentioned that uh, the point C, the 30% we're gonna be using and uh, the max is uh, allowed is 20%. But since we're having the, the lower, the upper deck, 
so uh, it's going to be using about 23% instead of the 30% of the land. So from the deck, we're going to be only uh, two extra feet of the, the setbacks permitted. Instead of the 30 feet, we're going to be 28 feet from the proper line on the back side. So which wouldn't be uh, much of disturbance for the back neighbor. Regardless, from the garage side, we're going to have an hour around the property is going to be installed new fences. So that was well, one of the things that the neighbor mentioned. If uh, we build the garage, they would like to have a fence. So that's already in the project. So we build a new fence out of the property. Uh, I think it's all I have to talk about this project. Would you like to address the five criteria that we need to vote on? Uh, what is that, sorry? What is uh, what is the, the five the five criteria that this, this board has to uh, so face yeah the, decision so on. would be the first one the the, the proposed the garage proposed that we're gonna be only like two feet from the the proper line and uh, this is the first the first point second point is gonna be the deck that we're gonna be twenty eight feet instead of the uh, thirty feet that is supposed to be. And then I'd like to mention as well that the stairs are going to be on the sides, so we're not going to be going like any further when they go out of the deck on the backyard. So the side uh, stairs, so they're not going to be having the stairs like uh, in the backyard towards the, the fence. And the other thing would be that uh, from since we're going to have the, the upper deck, we're only going to be using the 23% of the building of the, uh, the, the land. Okay, we need someone on your someone on your team to uh, address the five criteria that this that we we vote on. You'd like one of our checklists? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe some directed okay. questions might help. Okay. Um, Please, thank you. Is there something about this property? I mean, the, well, first of all, well, let me rephrase that. Sorry, let me try again. Um, is there something about this property in particular compared to the other properties why this garage has to be this close to the property line? What is it that, that's special about this this property? Well, I mean, they, they, they don't have enough space to have the garage built. This is the, the main thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason and the special reason that they request is, first of it, as I mentioned, and um, first of all, I'd like to forgive me, it's my first time participate in the no, board no, meeting, so okay. that's why I'm a little nervous. Yep, that's fine. But uh, yeah, so uh, since we have uh, Mr. and Mrs. Opria as a senior citizen, they'll be very helpful to have, to have the garage built. And that's the only and the main reason that they decided. And also because of the kids, especially the newborn. So uh, it's uh, so that would address one of our criteria, which is a reasonable use. So what you're saying is that it's a reasonable use. What we also need to make a determination that because of something special about this property relative to the other ones around it, that's why this location of the I guess you've done that already. Okay, yeah, that's fine. That. That's fine. Uh, property do you have any uh, feedback for us about how you believe this will affect surrounding property values? It's around values. The, like the values of the property next door, particularly the one that you're coming close to the lot line. Well, I don't, I don't see how it's going to be any bad for the the price of the house, but it's going to probably increase. Well, it's going to increase the value of the house that we're working. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if that answers the question. But. Has there been any discussion with the neighbor on the side of the property where the garage is going to go? If there's somebody on your team who could address that, that, that would be potentially a good thing to do. Yes, come up, please. Yes. Um, our, our neighbor is here, and I'll let him speak for himself, uh, but I'll give what your, your name, Your name and address for the... Oh, I'm if sorry. You, if you could come up my to name, the microphone. And speak right into the end of the microphone, yes, please. Yes, my name is Jan Opria. And my address uh, is 1344 Islington. Uh, 
on, in Islington Street in Portsmouth. Um, I, I'm in the process of moving uh, across this uh, country from Ohio uh, to be living with my daughter and <coughs> son-in-law and my husband and I. Uh, and um, the pandemic showed us that we want to be together. And But the one thing is we need a house that we can all live together. And my husband and I um, can you know, I, I'm looking for a 20-year plan uh, to be able to grow old in this house. Um, this is a two-story house, and so we need to make sure we make adap adaptions to it for us. And uh, the one is having a garage nearby that we can go to and have a car that we don't have to clean off. Um, and so, yes, we talked to Brad and Carol, uh, and like I said, I'll let them talk. I know they, they've been sitting here long. Excuse, excuse me, ma'am. You, oh, you need to address, I, I'm sorry. You need I'm, to address yes, us. Yes, I, I know. I'm sorry. Um, but I will let them talk to their own. But my takeaway was that this will do, they, they will, and they understand why we need the garage. They think that they, they, they're fine with it, but um, would like us to build a fence on the property line just to provide additional privacy. Uh, and I said that's perfectly fine. Uh, and uh, so we would do that, not as part of, you know, not before doing the garage, but that fence will come um, as we get through all the other, I, right now I'm just trying to get the house so I can move in it, uh, and then the fence will be coming. Uh, but we made a commitment to build that fence. Um, and um, so that, that addresses that. And in keeping with the um, neighborhood, um, I have done a walkthrough around the neighborhood. There are many um, houses um, in the area there are houses in the area, I shouldn't say many, that also have it up to the abutment. Um, and I draw in blank, I, again, I'm new to the area. Um, I think it was Aldrich, um, which is the nearest street that I saw, which is uh, almost a similar thing. Um, so um, I think we're keeping in with it. And I, I agree with what Jeff says. Uh, the remodeling, the, our house is for the, I think the past 10 years or so was a rental, um, and that's the name that you have listed as the owner, uh, was is the owner of the rental. Um, and so there was minimal upkeep to it. And uh, we've been working with Alpha Construction to bring everything up to code and to um, really uh, give it a, a clean, fresh look to it. Um, so uh, the garage, will be uh, keeping with the style of the house and can only uh, increase the housing value around there. Thank you. Did that address all your things now? Close enough. Yeah. Close <laughs> enough. Okay. <laughs> and as far as the, the deck, uh, and, and what Jeff was saying, my, my son-in-law, I, I won't look back, who um, is very good with numbers, when he saw the 20 to 30 percent, and I'll let him do the calculation, we think that was calculated thinking that the deck would be taking up ground coverage. It, it is an elevated deck off of our kitchen, so there's still ground under the deck. And so that's why um, he was calculating it out to be um, just uh, 20, going from 20 to 23. Uh, but uh, we would like to see how, I guess the thing is, we'd like to see how that was calculated. Um, and. Um, the deck, it's, it's a minimal two feet um, addition, which will allow us to go from a six foot to an eight foot um, deck, allowing us to put a table there for all of us to sit around. Um, our neighbor behind us, uh, who is also here, and I know she will speak uh, about it, was um, also talking about privacy, and we talked about adding additional um, plants and stuff there next spring, et cetera, um, it, the, at our fence line to address the privacy. But um, as I said, it, it, we could build a six foot one, but this eight foot would give us plenty of room for a table and allow uh, my husband and I to get around the table as, and also the kids without um, worrying about the kids falling you know, over and things like that. <clears throat> Good deal. Great. Any other questions? No, no, thank you. How much time they got left? Maybe we just, you know, ask the questions, ask the questions to him 
or I could, you know, I would if you would like. Yeah, 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 please. Maybe, maybe we could speed this along. Sir, I've been doing this about five years, and I still get nervous whenever I do this, so I share your nervousness tonight. So let me just ask you, the, there's five criteria we'd use to judge an application. Okay. So one is the granting the variance is not contrary to the public interest. So do you think this is contrary to the public interest doing this? I don't think so. No. Is that a no? No. Thank Sorry. You. Granting the variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance. The spirit of the ordinance is that this this doesn't benefit you, uh, doesn't harm the general public more than it benefits you. So that is that true? Um, no. Nope. Nope. Okay. Uh, granting the variance does is to do substantial justice. Uh, that was that one. That doesn't diminish the doesn't make the houses around you worth less because you're doing no. this. Okay. And literal enforcement of this ordinance results in an unnecessary hardship. So if we don't let you do this, would that be a hardship to the people that you're working for? Yeah, that would be yes. All right. Good deal. <coughs> thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you, Jim. <laughs> Any, anybody else on the board questions at this point? No? Apparently not. Thank you. Anybody else from your team need to speak right now? No? Okay, we'll open it up uh, to comment. First off, anyone wishing to speak in support of this? Anybody, we have anybody, Mr. Stith, on the Zoom? Uh, nobody's raised their hand. Okay, thank you. Anybody, anybody in the audience come, wish to speak, come up and speak in support, okay? Anybody, anybody in the audience wish to come up and speak in opposition? Okay, come up, please. Line up. And if we could have your name is, uh, names and addresses, please, for the record. Um, thank you, uh, Chair and Board. Uh, my name is Brad Mead, and this is my wife, Carol Mead. We live at 1324 Islington Street. We are the abutters to said property where this garage wants to go in. <clears throat> we are approval. We think it's fine that they put up a garage. There's several things that we haven't seen or gotten out of them what the garage is going to look like or where it's properly going to sit. Nothing was ever marked out. The property has not been surveyed. They're going off a of lot lines. They went off a lot line that I told them that I believe is 15 feet from my garage because I had a 10 foot setback, but the property line is 15 feet from the garage, I said, well, I think this is where the property line is. So they're basing where they're gonna put the garage off of where I think it is. S starting off, they have done a beautiful job with this house. I mean, new siding, new roof, new windows. It is a, a, a great addition to the surrounding area. Uh, we're very thankful that they bought it. Um, we do have some concerns in previous talkings with them. We were talking about um, originally a four foot setback. Their builder said, well, they can't do a four foot setback. It has to be a two because they're coming three feet off of the house and they want to make a 20 foot front and 22 foot back. My garage is a 22 by 24. Um, I have a 16 foot door with three feet on one side and two feet on the other side. So they could actually put a 18 foot garage in there 22 feet deep. Um, I was an next builder. I actually built my garage back when I was a little younger. <laughs> We've owned this house for 20 years. Um, we take a lot of pride in our house and we want our privacy and we want them to have their privacy. If they get a two foot setback from their garage, their workers will be siding on my property and the equivalent will be on my property to put the roof on and all that, all the stuff that needs to be done. I don't know how they're gonna dig a foundation even though it's all granite. They can come around from the back and go over their, 
their sewer line that's buried in the ground there that goes in the back street. So there's a lot of, lot of things. The drainage, um, they haven't addressed the drainage. I put crushed stone in my garage so it didn't go down into my next door neighbor's yard and it seeps down in the ground. I also was told that they are going to put a flat roof on this building. Well, that's what you told. I said, I said, I so, please, so, please, you, you can you can come up and correct that later, please. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank you. they really don't know what they're putting up there. That there's just a garage. I have not seen any pictures of the garage. There was nothing in this that I printed off from the the city of Portsmouth with all the reasons why they think they should have it. Um, I'd, I'd like to be known as a good neighbor, and I think I am a good neighbor, but there's only a certain amount of things that you can do to be a good neighbor. If this goes up for two foot or the four foot, I would like a fence all the way down my property. The other concern I have is I'm putting up, I'd like a fence put up, where are they gonna put the snow? Are they gonna put it in my, my yard? I mowed that lawn next door for 15 years and I plowed it for 15 years. Only place to put the snow is straight back where that garage is going. So I, 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 there's a lot of concerns that we have. Um, let me see if there's anything I didn't get here. So for the back deck, I'm doing this speaking on it because I know what was there before. There was two landings in the back of the house. Mm -hmm. The stairs went inwards to each other. They did not go out on the backyard. The landing was three foot by five foot. I mowed around this once a week for 15 years. And there was, it was, it was just an egress landing to go out of the house, out of the kitchen, if there was a fire. That was not a deck. It was not six feet. It was not, you know, it was three foot in depth and five foot long and then went downstairs inside. I am, am saying this because one of the neighbors that's gonna speak, it will actually look right into her yard when people are up on the deck, which is fine, you know, uh, but she, she has thoughts about that, she could tell you. Um, and I don't know if light and air um, are any concern to this board. If a garage goes up there, I have my grapes on a, on a large trellis. I have my pear trees. I have my blueberry, blueberry bushes, my strawberries. Everything's on out in the backyard. I don't know how much shade that will shade my products that I been working on for years would mm. would uh, would hurt. We're all for the garage, but four feet away, I want to know if it's a single story or are they going to be doing a double story? I have no idea. Um, and um, but I, I just I have these concerns and th there's other concerns that are on here, but they're, they're petty. And it, I, I want to keep good neighbors, but I want it done right, and I don't want to be taken advantage of. So. Thank you. Any Thank you. questions from the board? Any questions from the board for the speaker? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Chairman. Okay, you're welcome. Anyone else to speak in opposition? Anybody else? Any, Mr. Stith, we all clear on Zoom? All clear. Okay. Anybody else in opposition, please come up. Hi, uh, my name is Jill Tapscott. Um, excuse me, could you speak, try to speak right until the end of that thing? You had it, said you this to, was it's kind of directional. This was yeah. for the short people. I thought it was going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, my name is Jill Tapscott, and I live at 163 Melbourne Street, which is directly behind um, the Islington Street property and um, I have uh, myself and, and family have lived there for over 22 years 
And so being directly behind that property, anything um, outside that is happening does directly affect us. And the, um, the, the Islington Street property, as, um, as Brad mentioned, there was not a deck there before. And they are asking for a deck size that will be over 286 square feet. It's up, as the, the contractor mentioned, it's up at the second level. And, it, and the land itself also is up higher. It's not level land, it's up <coughs> higher. So this deck would overhang and look directly into my backyard. Um, clear open view overlooking my family patio space in my backyard. It would eliminate our um, privacy and peacefulness that we have been enjoying in our backyard and permanently affect our quality of life of enjoyment in our backyard that we have had. The shed that they have mentioned in their document that blocks, um, that blocks view into um, from their deck, there is no um, obstruction of my shed from their view on that deck across the whole back of their property that would prevent them from seeing into my backyard. They still will have, no matter where they would be standing on that deck, would have full view into, into my backyard. Um, this um, would also the deck at that height and that size would also impact the noise level into our bedrooms at the back of my house that we can clearly hear their voices to a point that we can clearly hear what they are saying when they are out there. Um, a deck this size would impact the resale value of my property as my pleasant backyard would not be as desirable a place to, um, to relax along with the um, peace and quiet um, that would no longer exist with having open windows of, um, of my bedrooms. And the, um, um, the, the, the setback of the, the, the 30 feet and the additional two feet that they are talking about having um, to make it an eight foot deck as opposed to a six foot that would be allowed um, gives an, an additional almost 70 feet to to the deck, and um, and again the, the we would lose our privacy. We would lose, um, and it would be there would be additional noise there. I also have a concern, um, the same that that Brad had brought up about the runoff from the from the garage. Um, my my, again, my property is directly back from theirs. My property is also um, directly back from um, Brad's garage, <coughs> and he put in the the, um, the the stonework on both sides of his garage. And I have no problem in my yard from any runoff from his garage. And there's, as he said, also um, we have not seen any plans or any designs um, of this garage, and I have a big concern of water runoff from the garage as the natural ground area would not be absorbing water before it flows downhill directly into my yard, and the excess water would affect the, the usability potentially of my yard. I'm also concerned about my foundation. I currently have a, and have for 22 years, a, um, a dry basement um, that's very usable, and I'm concerned that there would be a, a water problem there as well. Um, planting things um, at the at the fence line to help with privacy, which you know um, we we did talk about, and would be um, would be wonderful privacy for both of our properties. This um, the the types of plants. Um, or vegetation that would need to be there for privacy for a second story deck would need to be um, considerably tall and um, and fast growing uh, because as you know as he said it would be second story it's also up at a higher level that um, that gives clear view so unless something was e extremely tall it wouldn't wouldn't have the effect of, of privacy and um, um, the, the, ordinance, the ordinances and the setbacks um, that you all have in place 
I understand them to be for the protection of abutters and for the quality of life of people living in Portsmouth. And as Brad said, I want to be a good neighbor as well, but I also want to be able to maintain my property value and not have it diminished by, um, by excess water damage um, or loss of quality <clears throat> of life there and um, of, of enjoying it. And I'm just asking you to uh, please abide by the setbacks and ordinances that, um, that you all have put in place. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions for you, Mr. Lee? So I'm looking at a photograph of the, ha of the house. If you were standing in your backyard looking at the back of this house, to the left of that, there is what appears to be a pretty similarly sized deck on that house. So when you're in your backyard, do you hear conversations from the people on their deck at that house that exists now? If I'm over on that side of my yard, yes, I very clearly hear them. Okay. But I'm, but my, but that's not my, that's not my backyard. My okay. my backyard, which we, I, my patio and, and 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 grill and where we where we you know enjoy. That's her house. Yeah, I understand, but this okay. is. You can't. Yeah. There are no pictures of my of my house that has been attached to that. There are no pictures. Yeah, we have a we have a Google Earth view of it. So. You have Google Earth. We see, oh, we oh see, okay. We see. You can when if if you are if you are on the, the the deck that they are proposing, you will look directly into my backyard. In fact, you you should be able to see if you're looking at it now, my patio and my um my my, my grill on that that's right there directly back. Okay, thank you. That was a okay. Question. Do you think that uh, view is any different from looking out the four windows that are in that same location where the deck would be? Do I th think the um, the the? In other the, words, does the deck provide some additional view that's not already there from the four windows that are on the back oh, yes, of the house? Yes, because the the if you're looking out the four windows from inside the home, then you're 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 looking you're looking yeah. you're looking straight out, and you're inside the home. If you're out on a deck, especially six to eight feet out, then and it's it, it's overhanging my property more. And and again it's if you can visualize it's up higher and so it's it's going to be extending out and there um my, my my privacy is is completely eliminated and as and i'm also not going to hear if they're inside their house looking out the window i'm not going to be hearing a lot of noise um if they're inside <clears throat> is that a fence between your yard and their yard in the back yes it's a chain link fence. But that's far below the level of the of what the deck would be. And I understand that a six foot a six foot deck is 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 acceptable. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any anybody else? Any other questions from the board at this point? No? Thank you. Who oh, yes, come up. A anyone else in the opposition, please come up. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ralph DiBonato Sr. and I'm speaking for my wife and I. Uh, we reside at thirteen seventy four Islington Street, which is one house lot down from the house that you're discussing tonight being one other house in between us. Uh, I first want to say that Linda and I are in agreement with uh, the last two speakers about the issues that are not clear. Sir, could you, could you try I, to sorry. speak? I'm sorry. Yes, uh, I apologize. These microphones were a little touchy. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. My wife and I are in agreement with the previous two speakers with their concerns. Uh, I, are, we feel are legitimate. But I'm going to uh, uh, keep my comments to the five criteria that are laid out for you to consider for a variance. And I'm particularly going to focus on the last one that speaks of unnecessary hardship. 
uh, first after attending many of your meetings over the years and, and watching on the uh, website. Uh, I think it's the most misunderstood of the five. Uh, it makes it clear in the handout that the city provides that we're speaking of a hardship of the land. And, and I would like to relate to you how I understand that. Sitting here in a meeting some time ago, waiting for a particular subject to come up uh, beside a local esteemed lawyer, I leaned over and I said, I don't understand this hardship of the land. He said, most people don't, and I'll give you the best explanation that I think most people will understand. He said, you own a six acre lot, but it has a three acre pond in the middle of it. And there is nowhere that you can build a house on the remaining land without being in violation of the setbacks. He said, to me, in my judgment, that would be a prime example of a hardship of the land. The land itself prevents you from using your property in a reasonable manner. Uh, keeping that in mind, uh, it further states uh, that uh, the, owing to the specific conditions of this property that distinguish it from other properties in the area, that quote, this particular house is identical to the duplex next to it that sits between us and them, except for the roof design. It, is all, it was also designed and built by the same people probably 100 years ago uh, as a duplex. Uh, the lots are identical in size, and both those properties have existed for that 100 years in compliance with the zoning that now exists when it came into being. It didn't exist when they were built. But the the one in between, the closest to us, has had some variances that allowed them at, at a time to build a deck. And I will make a comment that relates to what the previous speakers said. We, in kindness, agreed to not object to the decks that were built onto the house next to us because they were built without permits and the person was here begging forgiveness instead of permission, they were all done. And we have regretted it ever since because we have no privacy in our backyard. That deck sets eight to 10 feet above our backyard, is not 10 feet from the property line and looks down into our yard and our patio. Th that is a consideration of people's property, value, use of their land. Uh, the 10 foot setback that is required, side setbacks, as far as I can tell, is the least setback in any of the zoning uh, criteria in the city, except for the downtown business district that allows properties to be built to the line if they meet the fire codes. There's reasons for the setbacks. The setbacks are to uh, not over intensify the use of the property. And there, there is one other that I'd like to speak to in a professional sense. I retired as the deputy fire chief of operations here in the city. I hold an associate degree in fire protection. And I cannot think of a better reason for a 10 foot setback between wood frame mes uh, residential properties than fire protection. We have a terrible history of, tr of conflagrations in this city, and all of them related to building materials and wooden roofs. After the great fires in the 1800s, we had building codes and zoning that said all of our downtown would be built out of masonry and have actually slate roofs. That, that has been diminished in recent years with fire protection like sprinklers. But to have 20 feet between properties, it should be the bare minimum. And, and there is nothing about that property that creates an unnecessary hardship. There is no hardship of the property. It can be used in accordance with the zoning that exists. And I know that people get exceptions, 
and we are seeing to lead, lean toward exceptions in this city in recent years because I think it's because we recognize that people want to stay here and they want to change their homes in a manner that accommodates their growing families or whatever. Uh, times change. Uh, but if you apply that fifth criteria of unnecessary hardship, uh, it's, it doesn't exist for the, for the extent of exceptions that are being asked for. And uh, I will leave it at that with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board to the speaker? Apparently not. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in opposition? Anyone else? Please come up. Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Anybody? Mr. Stith, we, we all set? We do have, no, we have one person. Oh, we have um, a Zoom? Okay. Barbara Marino. Okay. Go, go ahead, please. Hi, folks. I'm Barbara Marino. I live in 1345 Islington Street, right across the street from the house that we're discussing. I am so impressed with my neighbors' ability to articulate the concerns that they have. And for the new neighbors, we all agree your home is beautiful now, and we encourage you to continue to be good, generous neighbors. We. I agree we should be complying with the, with the criteria. I do not have any <coughs> recommendations or any other ideas for the board to consider, but I'm strongly in favor of having the smaller garage or no garage, and I agree with Jill about the deck. So I just wanted to register my concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions from the board for this speaker? No? All right. Thank, <clears throat> thank you for calling in. All right. Two for last call. Two for or against. Good evening, Rick Beck said thirteen ninety five Islington Street. I'm actually a neighbor that lives just down the road from you, and I don't want to be two for against. Um, I've known uh, previous speakers, several of them, for the twenty plus years that I have lived just down the road from this establishment. I, I, I think what you're hearing is uh, acceptance. Just they want to have it limited. I looked at the property that you had earlier tonight on Burkett, um, and I do not believe that the application is actually complete because it doesn't show anything other than a size. It doesn't show the scale. Now, on your Burkett one, it actually shows the scale, the model, the before and the after existing, and there's nothing other than just a flat two-dimensional drawing. What I would propose is that you would postpone this so that maybe between the neighbors and the uh, applicant, now that I guess the I guess the air has been cleared to a certain extent, people know more now than they did before, maybe be able to sit down. I'd be willing to go and sit down and be able to help in any way to be able to make it so that everybody is happy. I don't, I've known many of these people and these neighbors for many, many years, watched my family, my kids grow up uh, in the house and then move on with their lives. Um, I'm all about compromise, uh, always has been, uh, in my neighborhood and in others. Um, I would recommend maybe a postponement until we can come up with some kind of a plan uh, and more detailed drawings may be changed. I would have some recommendations of maybe a tandem garage or something that would suffice their wants and needs for a garage and the concerns of the neighbors next door, maybe possibly even the ones behind. So uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, any, okay. Anybody, last, last call. Two, four, or against. Come up, please. My name is Helton Rodriguez. I'm the owner of Hope. I'm sorry, would you spell your last name, please, so we get it clear? Helton Rodriguez. Thank you. Owner of Alpha Contracting, who work with uh, clients. I just want two points. We bring a plot plan, we send a plot plan. Uh, by the way, we did a survey. It's the survey that we have. We bring a plot plan. We didn't have the architectural plan yet because we just on the first meeting to see if it's gonna be approval for doing a garage. But we have a design, but we not a time to submit the design yet. So that's one of the, the things that I wanna be clear. Second, uh, said about the water goes to the other property. The water always goes to the other plot because the land is deep. If you look on the picture, I don't know if we have some other picture, but the land is deep to the other side, to the, to the back. 
So the orders, the orders that already goes there. Our plan is to build it up a garage with the drain. If you will be able, we're gonna connect to the house drain or if we're gonna make a dip and make a drain inside the lot. So that way we're gonna contain the water here. Now the water goes to the other side. For the snow, I saw the, how we're gonna move the snow. We have a lot of space up front to move the snow. If you will build up a garage over there, same I have in my place. I don't have enough, enough space to go to the side, but I enough to put on the front. Right on the front porch here, we can move the snow and make it work. And clients agree to be a little bit small. Instead of to be 20 by 22, we can come up to uh, 18 by 22. Make, uh, and to do the work, to do the work, we don't need to go on the other side. We can make the hole. We don't need to go there. We know their plans. We know their, everything over there. I'm doing this for over 20 years. We can work safe, and we're not going to cross to the other side. We're going to work direct inside here, make sure everything is protected. Even to the garage, so we don't have our tech for a plan, the garage is going to be probably 10 on the sides. Right on the center part is going to be uh, 14. So roof is probably the deep of the roof, so it's going to be probably 8, 8 to 12, something like that. So this is going to be one door garage that's we plan to do over there. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Any, no. no. Uh, Mr. Lee. Mm -hmm. Oh, Ms. Margison, oh, sorry. Well, I just, I just want to know for the record that it, it, 10.235 of the ordinance says that representations, drawings, everything are considered to be conditions upon which the variance is granted. If you have additional plans, additional drawings that really needs to be submitted to the board um, prior to us making a decision on it. We, we so any, that. I mean, so in other words, it's not that you get an approval yep. and then you come back, with, then you've got your plans. The plans need to be included in your application before we can give you an approval. Okay, I can do that. I can, I can submit that, that the other sex of the plans that we have and the okay. plans that we have for the, the garage. <clears throat> and for, for the deck, we'll already submit, but if you need something else, we can provide. Ms. Eldridge. I, I guess I don't feel that we can go forward with this tonight without the plans in front of us. Yep. And that's not any judgment on your proposal. But we don't have the no, information. It, it really it should have been flagged initially. Yeah. Um, so that's probably an oversight on staff. Yeah. That, that, so <clears throat> so staff? it's his fault. <laughs> I'm, I'm part of the staff. But, um. So I would like to see if we can just give them the time to do this properly and then be able to look at it more wisely but i also think a lot of the information you just gave us yep. was very worthwhile about the drainage and the the narrower garage so um we just need all the paperwork that that's okay we can we can submit to the city okay Mr. Lee, Mr. There seemed to be some question about exactly where the property line is. Yeah, so my question. It'd be kind of a, a problem if you built the garage and it wouldn't, wouldn't all on the correct property. So I think it'd be very important that you know exactly where the property lines are. Yeah. So if you're building it on the right. We, we're going we're gonna, we, I, I, I to have the survey, but before we, we start the work, we're going to bring the survey on site again to, okay. to put the points. Okay. Then, uh, then I have the exact line. To build it up. I think if I'm hearing this correctly, and you we can need to slap me later, I think what the board members are trying to tell you with that the application right now for what you propose to be doing is incomplete. Mm -hmm. So that if you would like to make a motion to withdraw, no, you can't. I, I, well, I think the public hearing is still going, but you could continue it. And request oh, okay. further okay. additional information. I think yeah. that's where we're going. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just, just like a. I'm sorry, my bad. I was thinking just the plot no, plan will be enough <laughs> for the size. We'll but I'll, I'll see you then. This guy. Yeah, we should have asked you for. It's not yeah. your fault. I'm sorry. Yeah. We we have been right. all over New Hampshire, <laughs> some different ways on the other towns, but it's okay. We can submit the plans. Okay. We do it the right way. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Usually. Thank you. Last two for last call. Uh, too far or against? Still against, I guess. Uh, still against in, in its present plan. 
I wanted to make a comment for the benefit of the applicant and the contractors. He made a reference to dealing with stormwater runoff by connecting it to the city, to the house drains. Uh, that is not allowed in the city. Stormwater runoff can't go into our sewer system. And there is no stormwater runoff available in that area except on um, uh, yeah, Melbourne Street, which is, below, is across the neighbor's property. There is none on Islington Street. It's all gravity from the top of the hill at the blinking light all the way to Vine Street down at the bad corner. There is no piping system for stormwater runoff. And that slope will not accommodate a water garden uh, that any that I have seen, but I wanted to make sure that it was known that uh, maybe, maybe the applicant needs to talk to si some city departments more about what is required of them also. Yeah, thank you. And just for the just for the record, we know who you are, but just Ralph your state Bonato, your name. 1374 Th thank, Street. thank you. Sorry. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate that. All right. Last. So we're right. at this point with a motion to continue this. Well, we, well, we haven't closed the yet. hearing yet. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we'll soon. I'm uh, I'm hoping now. <laughs> <laughs> Any too far again? Last call. Anybody on Zoom is the stiff we're all, we're all set. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Last this was this will be the last speaker. Just one real quick thing. Your, your name and address again for the uh, record. Brad Mead, 13, 20, uh, 1324 Islington Street, a butter. Um, can we have when this is all said and done, can we have this stuff in writing? How how do you well, oh, well, we'll put a fence up. Yeah, maybe. Or we're going to do the drain probably. Oh, maybe. Everything that we have done, discussed with them is, yes, we'll do that. Yes, we'll do that. Yes, we'll. I don't know if, if it's going to be done. I just have that concern. Okay. We haven't approved anything, but we often add stipulations that are important. Okay. I, I will tell you that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm gonna check this. <laughs> Best got him. Okay. <laughs> okay. Last, last, last call. Okay. Seeing none. Uh, Mr. Sith, we all clear on all clear. Zoom. Okay. Great. Okay. Public hearing is closed. What's your, what's your pleasure, board? Who wants to make the motion? Well, I, okay. I would move that we continue this till the allow the applicant time to complete their uh, their application. Second. Okay. Thank you. In Help including the, the all city. the all the all the things that we've discussed this evening. Yep. I, and I, I would Madison. just like to add, I was probably I was not going to support this application tonight because in your materials you describe what you wanted to do with the house and your reasons for doing it, but you did not address the five criteria. Um, and in the, your presentation you did not address the five criteria, and that is your responsibility as an applicant. I understand you're nervous, I please I do. But we have to base a decision on those five criteria. I'm not saying, you know, it's often hard for especially residential people to come in front of us, but they often do at least state that five criteria. That was not anywhere in your application materials. Yes, thank you. Okay. Any anything further? Somebody second ready with the mo second. second, yes. Mm -hmm. Did, was that a motion? A motion to continue no. to October. Motion. Yeah. yeah. Rossi second. Oh, I thought it was. I thought it was some of you. I thought I heard the word withdrawal. You can't. We don't want it. I said that earlier. Now, oh. I'm, now I'm to okay. to, uh, post, to uh, continue. Okay, continue. Okay, till next month. Great. Okay, Mr. Rossi, you agree? Second that. Okay. Yes. Any anything further on your motion? I have nothing to add. I think the motion speaks for itself. Okay. And Mr. Rossi. <clears throat> The only thing I would add is that, you know, just uh, beseech the applicants to work more closely with their neighbors so that when you do come back, uh, we don't have to resolve controversies. Okay. All right. The motion is to continue this until next month for further development of the refinement of the idea, further provision of information such as a survey, so, we, so for obvious reasons. And... Uh, Having said anything else to be said before we take a vote? No? Okay. 
Excuse me, let's start down the left, Mr. Rossi. Yes. Ms. Eldridge. Yes. Ms. Margison. Yes. Mr. Lee. Yes. Mr. Mantle. Yes. And I vote yes as well. So we're, we're continued until at least next month. Okay. So five applications. I have to vote to go past 10. Yep. Yep. We have uh, gone right past our 10 o'clock time frame. So does someone wish to make the motion to uh, continue? Make or a motion not? to continue beyond our stated time. Okay, thank you. So is there a second to that motion that we second. take up new business after 10 o'clock? Second. Okay, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any <laughs> <laughs> enthusiastically? Come on. <laughs> Any Anybody opposed? <laughs> should we take a walk? No. Off? no. <laughs> yeah, shoot, yeah. Truck on. Oh, we only have five yeah. more to go. Yeah, all right. Oh. Yeah. But the good news is we're on we're on OT. Right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Moving along. All right. Along. Moving right along. No place <clears throat> else to put this. Let me get the right motion here. Okay. Oh, that's the old one. Where's my, where's my new? Uh, too much paper here. Here we are. Okay. All right. Wow. One thirty gates. Okay. Uh, item B under new business reads as follows: the request of Martin Hansman, owner for property located at one thirty Gate Street, where his relief is needed to add an HVAC unit, which requires the following. A, one, a variance from section 10.515.14 to allow a three foot setback where 10 feet is required. Said property is located on assessor map 103 as lot 55 and lies within the general residence B, GRB, and historic districts. Who speaks in favor of this proposal, please? Apparently, nobody. Is nobody answer? here? Okay, who wants to make the motion we put this forward to? Uh, raising their hand. Hello? Yes? Um, hello, my name is Charlotte Bacon. I live at 61 Manning Street that abuts this particular property. Actually, I don't live there. No, I, no, I own no, that property no. and have for 20 years, and it's a rental property. No. Um, we have it. And I didn't realize that this was going to be going on um, and just received the notice in the mail that the uh, project was going to be discussed. Ms. Bacon, excuse me. Excuse me. Yes? We're, we're waiting to hear from the applicant to see if he's here to present. And then. Okay. Um, because we don't seem, he doesn't seem to be here, so it's likely going to be continued. I okay. see. Okay. Oh. All right. Who wants yeah, to make the motion to continue this till next month? So moved. Thank you. So, second? second. Second. Those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay, thank you. All right. Mr. Mr. Lee is going to take the next issue. All right. Want to sit down? I'll sit down here. Give me the gavel. Yep. I can hit it from here. There you go. All right. All right. So that would be uh, well, Melbourne. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, so, okay. Mr. Lee, just let the applicant know that we have five voting members. Okay. And um, give him the option to postpone if he wants. Yeah, he has, to, to him. he has to get four positive affirmative votes. I understand. Okay. So this is the request of Martin. No, no it's Gate Street. George. Wrong one. Okay, George That's Melbourne fine. Street. Yeah. All right. Request of George Pappas, owner for property located at 170 Melbourne Street, whereas relief is needed to conduct to add a 12 by 12 shed, which requires the following. One, a variance from section 10.573-20 to allow an eight foot left side yard where 10 is required. Number two, a variance from section 10.571 to allow an accessory structure to be located in the front yard. Three, a variance from section 10.521 to allow 26% building coverage where 20% is the maximum allowed. Said property is located on assessor map 233, lot 69, and lies within the single residence B, SRB District, LU-22-151. Who is here to speak to this application? Uh, George Pappas, uh, resident and owner of 170 Melbourne Street. All right. Uh, good evening. Oh, 
we, we, we only have when we have oh, five, sorry. Yeah, we five can, voting members you have to get four to get it so we I, give the applicant the opportunity to if they want to postpone they no. can or if you want to go ahead I'd like to go forward and Peter if you could just go to sure. I'll speak real quick um, I know I've got 15 minutes but if I can do this another five I think we all <laughs> win um, if we could go to the next one is shed design that's what the shed's going to look like. The next one s starts with current lot coverage. Uh, my lot is a non-conforming lot. Uh, the first 25 feet or so from the street is actually city property. So my lot is, is significantly smaller uh, in reality than it does look in presentation. If you could go to the next one, perceived lot would actually have my current uh, lot coverage at 15%. And if we can go to the next slide, you can say even with this new 12 by 12 shed, we'd be at 16.6. .6. So because of it's a small house on a small lot, you know, I've got a little bit of a, a, a I'm at a detriment. Uh, then, so that covers the, the first variance and the second variance is the uh, lots position. Uh, it is going to be, uh, preferably, I need 10 feet from the property line. I'm looking for eight. Uh, there is actually a fence between my house and my neighbor's house. Uh, so it's not even, so it's gonna be encroaching on his uh, visuals or what, it's, it's basically separated. There's already a fence there. Um, so that, Pretty much covers that and I think the five uh, points that you guys really want to hear about uh, let's see the variance will not be in contrary to public interest uh, the appearance and location of the shed will not negatively impact my my neighbors uh, uh, the public health safety or welfare it should not be threatened uh, the spirit of the ordinance, uh, because it is an overcrowded, it, <laughs> I'm sorry, because it will not be overcrowded, and uh, the, the existing lot, uh, the fence buffers our properties, it will protect uh, privacy from both sides. Uh, substantial justice will be done. Uh, let's see. Because the approval of this variance uh, request does not pose a loss of public uh, space or general public, such as a denial to my variance request does not grant the public, general public, any gain. So they say we're both the same, right? And uh, the value of the, uh, the surrounding properties will not be d diminished. Uh, many of my uh, abutting neighbors have, uh, have sheds or outbuildings, and it, I think we're all good with it. Uh, and little inf literal enforcement of the provision of ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship. As I stated before, I've got a small house on a small lot, and uh, you know, so lot coverage is an issue. But it, the perception, uh, my neighbors would not know that I'm I'm not overcrowding anyone, basically. And uh, that <coughs> kind of sums up. I think it's under five minutes. Uh, <laughs> Any questions? I do have one question, but it might actually be for Peter. How is this the front yard? Well, so a front yard is in this district. It's thirty feet, and so it's it's not only the setback, but it's it's like an area thirty feet into the lot, and then to either side. So it's within that thirty feet. <clears throat> so it's it's behind the house, but it's still in the front yard. Because it's, uh, it's the house is only fourteen feet, so feet. Gotcha. Yeah. it's it's yeah. But it will be about forty six feet from the street. Right. Thank you. That is weird. Okay. Do any of the other neighbors that you have have um, sheds that can be seen from the street from the front? Yes, actually, one that just spoke. Um, she just left. Uh, she lives across the street, and she's got a shed there. Uh, and then two others, well, the, my next door neighbor has one, uh, that, the blue structure right there to the left, that's his shed. Um, and 
see, I guess that's it for direct and then up Melbourne Street a little bit. There's one John one that has two outbuildings. Good. Is your neighbor to the left, is the street address Essex or Melbourne? Uh, it is Essex. His driveway is on Melbourne. Okay. His front door is quasi on Melbourne, but it's actually an Essex address. It's Portsmouth. Thank it's you. all strange. <laughs> so do, do we get through the criteria? Yeah. <clears throat> I must have dozed off. Yes. <laughs> I've got a very mellow voice. <laughs> all right. Anything else from anyone? All right. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Is there anyone here to speak in favor of this application? On Zoom, Peter? No one on Zoom. All right. Is there anyone here to speak that wants to speak in opposition to this application? Is there anyone here that wishes to speak to, for, or against this application? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Board discussion. What's your pleasure? A motion? I would like to make a motion to approve the variance as presented. Okay. Do we have a second from anyone? Ms. Eldridge, I'll thank you. <clears throat> so your motion, Mr. Rossi. Okay. Uh, the variance is not contrary to the public interest and the spirit of the ordinance is observed because uh, it does not alter the essential characteristics of the neighborhood. Uh, the lot line clearance is consistent with his neighbor's lot, uh, his neighbor's shed, which actually is closer to the lot line, uh, and therefore uh, it is consistent. So I take that neighbor's shed as a fact in support of uh, this criterion. Uh, substantial justice is done. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no uh, detriment to the public that outweighs the loss. Uh, to the applicant if he were not allowed to have the shed. Um, so I think that's self-evident. The values of the surrounding properties, I don't see that being diminished again because of the uh, consistency with the character of the rest of the neighborhood and anytime you have a shed to keep all the junk in instead of uh, having it spread around the yard, I think that's good for the neighborhood. And uh, literal enforcement, uh, the fifth criteria, uh, there are special conditions in the property, particularly the setback from uh, Melbourne Street uh, that diminishes uh, and changes some of the clearance calculations uh, and makes it appear as though the shed is in the front yard when it really is not. Uh, and uh, I think that is a special condition that needs to be considered in terms of the equitable use of the property. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Eldridge, your second, please. I have nothing to add. Right, thank you. Is there anything else anyone else wishes to add before we take a vote? Peter, are you right? Are you taking I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Start down on this end, Mr. Uh, Mantle. Yes. Mr. Rossi. Yes. Ms. Uh, Eldridge. Yes. Ms. Margeson. No. And the vice chair votes yes also. So you're approved, sir. Wait. One, two, three. All right. And this application is approved. Thank you. And I'll turn the uh, gavel back to the chair. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Uh, moving right along to item D. Under new business, we have the request of Deborah Klein and Natan Aversary. Thank, thank you. Revocable, revocable Trust, applicant and owner for property located at 75 Monroe Street, whereas relief is needed to extend existing dormers on both sides of the house, which requires the following. One, variances from section 10.5 to one to allow A, an 11 and a half foot rear yard where 20 feet is required and B, a five and a half foot side yard where 10 feet is required. Two, a variance from section 10.321 to allow a non-conforming building or structure to be extended, reconstructed or enlarged without conforming to the requirements of the ordinance. Said property is located on a map 168 
as Lot 27 and lies within the General Residence A GRA District. Who presents this uh, proposal, please? With your permission, Chairman, Monica Kaiser from Hopeful Phoenix, Gormley and Roberts, on behalf of Deborah and Nathan. Deborah went home and went to sleep, but Nathan is here in the back row. <laughs> I, wish I, I, I wish I was also home asleep. Lucky her. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. Uh, I'm hoping this will be relatively simple, simple for you. Um, some of you may have been sitting on the board a few years ago um, when this, Peter, I'm trying. Hold when it, this, yeah. when this uh, large lot was subdivided, um, uh, I don't know, maybe three, four years back. Um, what we're talking about here is this lot that was retained here. Um, this is the corner of uh, Monroe Street on this side and Ward Place over here on this side. Um, there's an apartment building here in the front, uh, fronting on uh, Monroe Street. What we're here to talk about is this little building in the back. Um, this is an existing uh, apartment, um, single home right there. And then this is the larger apartment building over here. In between is a big parking lot right here. So this is up by, if you're familiar with the, um, you know, this is coming out South Street to head out of town. Over here is the uh, elderly home and the Middle Street Park. In any event, um, there's a picture of the home in your packet. Exhibit C gives you an overview from the top and then a picture of the house that we're looking at right there. So uh, Deborah and Nathan um, had a long-term tenant, um, many decades, uh, who recently passed away. They've taken the opportunity to rehabilitate this home, um, and they're going to be uh, just sort of expanding out those dormers. There's one on the front. There's one in the back. And they're just going to take that to the edge of the, of the home. So there's not going to be any increase to the footprint. The increase is only um, to the dormer on top. If you go back to the site plan, you can see that the... Can you make it big? Yeah. So there is, the lot has an address on Monroe Street, so this <coughs> is the front. This lot line back here is the back, the rear lot line. So this structure is within, um, uh, the wall is about 13 feet to the lot line. The roof is about 11 and change to the lot line. Maybe 11, uh, 11 point, well, you had the specific dimensions in your packet. In any event, this structure already exists and it's within the, the rear yard setback over there. And then this corner right here, it's about uh, five feet from that corner already existing. Um, the dormers proposed are just going to match the wall and the roof line that are there right now. Um, you can see that obviously there's already dormer there. It's just going to be a little bit longer on either side. Uh, that's the upshot of the project. To go through the criteria, um, I don't want to belabor what's in my packet, but it's not contrary to the public interest and the spirit of the ordinance is observed. I go through the purposes of your ordinance and essentially discuss each one and say, look, this is a minimal expansion of an existing non-conforming structure. Um, the footprint, the coverage, the height, all those things are going to remain the same. There's just a slight expansion of the dormers on either side. Um, there's the expansion's not going to uh, result in uh, any impact on the adjacent properties relating to outdoor lighting or noise or anything of the sort. Um, it's going it, to, frankly, improve the uh, visual environment because it's accompanied by an overall rehabilitation of the building. Um, it's outside the historic district. Um, and in terms of uh, environmental issues, it has no impact compared to existing conditions. It's not going to change uh, the alter, uh, it's not going to alter the essential character of the locality or threaten the public health, safety, and welfare. Um, it's just a simple um, expansion, um, primarily resulting from the fact that, you know, they're doing substantial interior renovations inside this dwelling, and so they have to bring it up to code. 
they could use the additional space to meet their various clearances and just make it a more livable uh, home. Um, it's not going to diminish surrounding property values because it's going to improve this property um, and by extension the ones around it. Um, results in an unnecessary hardship. I would submit that there's special conditions related to this property because of the way it's configured and because of the structures already on it. Um, again, not making anything bigger except for that dormer. No change to the footprint. Um, but anything that we do to that building um, is going to require relief. Uh, no fair and substantial relationship exists because, again, um, the building already exists, is non-conforming. It's only getting uh, ever so slightly non-conforming by extending these dormers on either side. Um, the neighborhood is fairly densely developed with other uh, structures within the setbacks. Uh, for those reasons, there's no fair and substantial relationship. The proposed <coughs> use is reasonable. It's a residential use, a residential zone. Uh, it's a long existing non-conforming residence on the property. Um, and they're simply just trying to create some more livable space upstairs. So for that reason, I would say that it meets the unnecessary hardship criteria. Substantial justice is done because there's no benefit to the public from denial that outweighs the, the hardship to the applicant. Did I state that right? It is getting late. <laughs> <Closeness>. <laughs> Again, for the same reasons I've been saying, they're simply just trying to uh, get a little more headroom um, on the upper floor of this home. Um, it doesn't appear that anyone's here to speak uh, against the application, but I think on its face, um, it's a very modest request. So I'm happy to entertain any questions. Otherwise, I'll stop. Any questions from the board? Apparently. Apparently not. Thank you. Anyone present or via Zoom who wishes to speak in support? Anyone in opposition? Anyone to, for, or against? Apparently not. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. What's your, what's your pleasure, board? We've heard the proposal. <clears throat> I move to uh, grant the variance as requested. Thank you, Mr. Rossi. Is there a second to that? Second, second, second. Mr. Mr. Lee, thank you. Mr. Rossi, a motion. <clears throat> I, uh, I move, my motion is to accept the variance as uh, submitted, and if I could pr be permitted to do so, I would say that uh, the exact verbatim statement as read to us by Ms. Kaiser uh, is <laughs> a very adequate uh, description of how the five criteria are met and I will leave it at that. No, we can't do that. <laughs> oh, come on. You can't say ditto. <laughs> it is oh, late. <laughs> okay. You well, can't do it. Uh, the uh, overarching fact is that it is a minimal uh, change to an existing structure that is non-conforming and does not change uh, the conformance of the property. Uh, in any uh, in any way at all, uh, so the variance that's being requested is not contrary to the public interest or the spirit of the ordinance because it's really not introducing a change uh, to the property uh, other than a cosmetic change to the ex exterior. Uh, substantial justice is done because uh, there is no harm to the public uh, presented by this proposal, and uh, therefore uh, a re rejection. Uh, therefore. There's nothing to outweigh uh, the loss to the applicant, uh, if something you, like that. You see, it's a tough one. <laughs> it's not that easy. <laughs> I said it's what she, like what she said. Uh, so uh, there is the benefit to the applicant is not outweighed by harm to the public because there is no harm to the public by simply extending the dormers. Uh, the values of the surrounding properties uh, will not be diminished. I toured the uh, or ex examined the property earlier today. Uh, the revision is very consistent with what's in the neighborhood uh, and uh, it will probably be an improvement and therefore will have no impact on uh, reducing the value of the surrounding properties. And uh, literal enforcement of the uh, ordinance uh, would serve no purpose and just present a hardship to the use of the property uh, to the enjoyment of the owners. 
Thank you. That's it. Right. I'm done. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Second? I concur and have nothing to add. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion before we take a vote? I still think she said it better. <laughs> Is anyone likely to appeal this? <laughs> 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 Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, though, let's let's start down with Mr. Mantel. The yes. motion is to approve. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lee. Yes. Uh, Ms. Marderson. Yes. Ms. Eldridge. Yes. Mr. Rossi. Yes. Yes. And I vote yes as well. You're all you're all approved. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you for reaching us. Have a nice night. <laughs> <laughs> What's left of it? <laughs> okay. Okay. Three left. Two left. Two left. Two left. Well, the next one's a special mm -hmm. exception. All right. Yeah. Moving right along. Let's do the second page, too. Okay. Yeah, there is. Yeah. One more. You're on your own on that one, but wait. I'm going to take a shot at uh, pronunciation and hope I can get corrected. Right for this. It's the request of Rob. Curo. Curo? Correo. Correo. All right. Well, that was my second choice. Applicant. For Versaw's Pantry LLC owner for property located at 3020 Lafayette Road, where a relief, relief is needed for proposed retail cabinetry outlet, which requires the following. One, a special exception from Section 10.440, use number 8. Point thirty one to allow retail sales conducted within a building which is permitted by special exception. Said property is located on Assessor Map 292 as Lot 152 and lies within the Mixed Residential Business MRB District. <coughs> Who speaks in favor of this proposal, please? I am uh, Rob Correo, not only the applicant, this is incorrect. I'm also the owner. Okay, thank I bought, you. I purchased the building. Thank you. So, okay. oh, thank you. Well, um, I'll make this quick and address everything. I'll start out by saying the current use has been a grocery store and use of a hood, stove, fire, um, refrigeration. Um, the parking lot, uh, I suppose it has 15 parking spaces, but they're not marked. The landscaping has been overgrown. There's been a lot of rot on the building. Um, there's a lot of thing, a lot of things currently that have to be improved. I purchased the building, um, and I'm going to be objective because I have multiple locations. I own all the real estate that we uh, where we reside in. We have uh, I also have warehousing that I do also own as well. Our properties, uh, two of which are the most recent, have been in Salem, New Hampshire, on 28. I own those properties in the plaza, my warehousing. And then in Amherst, New Hampshire on 101A, I uh, purchased that as well. Uh, 101A in Amherst, objectively, we bought it. I bought a building that was um, um, probably wasn't the nicest building in that, na that area, and we improved it. And um, I improved not only the value, also the, the, the decor, and I also uh, brought it up to code and made it safe. And I also brought, obviously, jobs to the to the area. So, um, the following standards, uh, I believe, will meet um, the requirements from Portsmouth. Is one, um, I am going to improve the lot. Um, the exception is needed uh, because I'm going into. It's going to be retail, but it was. Uh, a grocery store which they did cook right on site in that grocery store for a long time um, so I'm not going to require any fire anything all my displays are non-functioning um, it's not gonna um, create any hazard or um, uh, increase the basically the the detriment of the, it's not going to be a detriment to the neighborhood. Um, the values are going to go up because of the work that we're going to do. Um, I'm not going to in, in, uh, increase the, the resources um, and traffic safety or create a hazard. We uh, will be open Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5, Wednesday till 7. 
We mostly have uh, a lot of our account managers work remotely. We'll have two to three people at a time in the showroom. Um, we don't get a steady flow of walk-ins. Mostly uh, we work with over 70% of our sales or our businesses with contractors and developers, and they send um, people into the showroom to look at the door styles, to pick the door styles. Um, we will not do any manufacturing or assembly inside the building. We have uh, warehousing and industrial and manufacturing for that. This is just retail, and we're just going to display the doors. Um, it won't, again, create any traffic hazard or, or use more resources. Uh, it actually will lower uh, because the water use obviously is going to go down. There's not going to be any grease traps or anything like that. We're going to remove all of that. Uh, demand on uh, municipal services, um, water sewer, again, it's going to go down. Even the refrigeration and the amount of uh, resources it used, and it, it used <coughs> a lot. Um, Storm water runoff uh, into the street, not going to happen. Uh, we are going to enhance the landscaping, um, the front of the building, uh, even the ramp is all cracked, and we're going to have to remove that because uh, it's a safety issue. So I believe that um, we meet the criteria uh, from the town. I've been wanting to invest and in, come into Portsmouth for a while now. And this is obviously one of, I, I hope, of uh, other properties that I purchase in the area. Um, so my goal is obviously to not only put the showroom here, but enhance the uh, surrounding area and uh, the building. Um, any, any questions? Any questions from the board at this I'm point? I'm sorry, I'm not at, I'm not 100% on my game. I'm pretty tired right now. Right and I got like an hour drive. <laughs> well, we don't have that, but welcome to the club. <laughs> yes, uh, thank, all set. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, the room is empty, uh, so I do, I'm going to call for speakers anyway for form. And Mr. Smith, 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 excuse me, it is late. Just checking, just checking the uh, Zoom. Uh, no one, no one has raised their hand. No, nobody, are, nobody is still awake. Okay. All right, thank you. All right. Anybody have a have a motion? Yeah, I'll make, use a motion. Of, I'll make a motion. Make a motion to huh? approve as presented. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Mr. Rogerson, thank you. Mr. Mandel, your motion, please. Peter, you ready? Yep. <laughs> okay. 10.232.21 uh, standards as provided by this ordinance for particular use permitted by special exception. Yes. Uh, two, two. no hazard to the public or adjacent property on account of potential fire, explosion, release of toxic fume. Yes, if anything, it's going to reduce all that because I've been to Bursar's Pantry when it was an active store many times. Um, not so much toxic fumes, but uh, next one, point two three, no detriment to property values in vicinity or change in the essential characteristics of any neighborhood, including residential or businesses and industrial districts, and on account of the location and scale of the buildings and other structures, parking areas, excess ways, odor, smoke, gas, dust, other pollutants, noise, glare, heat, vibration, unsightly outdoor storage or equipment, vehicles, or other material. Uh, yes, there won't be any of that. Uh, it's going from a retail convenience store to a retail showroom. Uh, and the last one, well, that's not the last one. We've got two more. Point two four: no creation of public safety hazard or substantial increase in the level of traffic congestion in the vicinity, which is a big <coughs> no. It's right on the corner, and the parking lot is off to the right. Uh, point two five: no excessive demand on municipal services, including, but not limited to, water, sewer, waste disposal, police, fire, and schools. That's a big yes as well. And number two six, no significant increase of stormwater runoff on the adjacent property. That's also a yes. So you meet all the criteria in my book, and that's why I made the motion. 
Thank you. You're, can I get a second. comment about each of this? No. <laughs> can, I get a, can I get a relevant fact about each of this? A what? A relevant fact or a finding about each of those last two criteria? The last two? Yeah. Uh, no excessive, excessive demand on municipal services, except for water, sewer, and possibly waste disposal, which is standard for any retail or house, it would be a lot less than what's already approved to be in there right now, which is a convenience store. That's simple. Uh, no significant increase on stormwater runoff. There won't be anything. Nothing's changing as far as the stormwater runoff. Thank you. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. Good. My first time, so. Yeah. I didn't want to strike out. So maybe, that's maybe that's a second. Yeah, and I'll just add a few things, if you don't mind, Peter. Right. You can throw open at me if you want. Yeah. With respect to 10.232.21, the first standard, mm -hmm. um, section 8.31 of the zoning ordinance allows for non-marine related retail sales to be conducted in a um, uh, mixed resident business zone. And um, with respect to 10.233.23, um, I just want to add that the mixed residential business zone provides areas where you have a limited range of businesses, establishments, and live work units that can be located near or next to, uh, adjacent to residential developments. Um, and so therefore introducing, not introducing, but um, having a retail sale um, will not be detrimental to the property values in that area. Okay. Some Thank you. Use this waste. Okay. Anything? Anything further? Get to use no. It, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Motion. <clears throat> Motion's been made Next and seconded. Uh, let's take a let's take the vote, Mr. Rossi. Uh, this is to approve, right? To approve. Yes. 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 Ms. Eldridge. Yes. Ms. Ms. Marges. Yes. Mr. Lee. Yes. Mr. Mantle. Yes. And I vote yes as well. Who who remembers the last thing we approved for that site? Anybody? <laughs> Construction company. Eight of course. That's not it. We got one left. Never moved in. Oh, you're, all, you're all set. You're all set. You're Thank approved. You so much. Much. We're just chatting amongst ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know you guys are going. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank hey, thanks. Job. Have a good drive back. Thank you. <laughs> we all, all right. want custom doors now. All right. <sighs> One more. Yeah, one more. Right up at the right. top. Wait, wait, there's but there's nobody here. here. Well, we'll nobody see. here. We still have to call. Who it wants down. to make a, Who might, wants yeah, to make the, the motion? Just announce it and see if anyone's. Yeah. Shows up. All right. Don't we have to? Wait. We'll have to. We have it? to. No. <clears throat> no. We no. Uh, make a motion. The last, the last item yes, is F. Item F under a new item, new business, and the room is empty. Therefore, there's nobody here to approve it. So, who would like to make a motion to continue this until next month? So. So. Seconded. Mr. Mantle and Mr. Seconded, Ross. Yeah. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay, thank you very much. We're done. I can't believe we all through that thing.